If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this beautiful episode of Mind Pump. Fantastical. Ooh, is it pretty? For the first 57 minutes, we have some fun introductory conversation. We go to the happiest place on earth. We do. Uh, we talk yeah, about Disneyland. Well, we talk about it anyway. Versus Legoland. Which one's better? Which one wins? Which one did Justin find? Oh, yeah, there is a huge difference. Yeah. Holy moly. <laughs> then we talk about lessons learned from a hiking weekend. Took my kids hiking uh, did some six mile hikes with my eight year old daughter. <laughs> you guys are such good. You dads. made everybody cry. It was good. It was good. We talked about behind the scenes of the Cirque du Soleil. That's an that was an interesting one. And then we talked about Walmart's move to automation and the impact of tech on business. And finally, Adam mentioned some Organifi recipes. Uh, if you go to organifyshop.com, enter the code Mind Pump, you will get a discount. Mm-hmm. Then we get into the questions. The first question was. Is there a difference in meal timing for men and women? In other words, if we eat small meals versus less frequent meals, how does it affect men? How does it affect women? Which one's better for fat loss? Which one's better for muscle building? Or does it not matter at all? The next question was, if we're not breaking up fascia with foam rolling, then what the hell is actually going on? Why do we like foam rolling so much? Ooh, I like pain. The next question was, do we subscribe to the theory that our body has a set point? Now, this is the theory that you have a particular body weight that your body inherently wants to be at, and no matter where you want to go, if it's higher or lower, your body's going to fight you to bring you at this magical set point. Not real. Yep. <laughs> it might, might actually be uh, Excuse. <laughs> bullshit. Uh, and finally, somebody asked us, what's the best way to address man boobs? Is there a technique with exercise and nutrition First acknowledge them. that can help uh, remedy this particular problem? Now, we did mention a compound them. called indole-3-carbonol or, and or DIM, which actually have anti-estrogenic properties in men and in women. You can find indole-3-carbonol in high amounts in cruciferous vegetables, including oh. cauliflower. Oh. Now, we are friends with Ooh. cauliflower foods. They make the pizza crust out of an entire head Ooh. of cauliflower. The so best cauliflower pizzas. If you go to Cali Flour, that's C-A-L-I Flour, F-L-F-L-O-U-R, foods.com, enter the code MINDPUMP, you'll get $20 off orders of $50 or more. If that doesn't work, get yourself a man's ear. That's it. That's it. <laughs> a bro. Also, this Not month, a bro, a bro. <laughs> we are giving away our no BS six pack formula workout program for free. So this is, it's basically a MAPS program just for your core to teach you how to train properly so that you can build visible abs at even at higher body fat percentages. Stack them bricks. That's right. Now, you can get that for free if you enroll in any of our bundles. Now, free? For free. Our bundles are MAPS programs combined together for a particular goal. So let's go over the MAPS programs real quick. Lightning round. If your goal is maximum muscle and strength, that's MAPS anabolic. If you want to train and sculpt your body to be on stage like a bodybuilder, physique competitor, or a, a bikini competitor, that's MAPS aesthetic. Serious people. If you want... Functional movement, strength, and performance. Like an athlete, that's mass performance. Use your muscles. If you want to work out at home or on the go with minimal or no equipment, that's MAPS anywhere. Who needs weights? If you want to train your body to not have pain and to move better, in other words, correctional exercise, that's MAPS Prime and MAPS Prime Pro. And we, Help my ouchies. And many times we bundle them together, specific MAPS programs like for example, if we combine MAPS Aesthetic with MAPS Performance, we call that the Sexy Athlete Bundle. We have a lot of bundles, like the Super Bundle, which is nine months of exercise program. Probably our most popular bundle. If you get any bundle, we'll give you the No BS Six Pack Formula absolutely for free this month only. You can find this all at mindpumpmedia.com. T shirt time! Oh, it's that time. My favorite time. How many reviews did we do, Doug? 16 reviews. That's not what? bad. One time I want you to come in and be like, 1,000. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't read that many. 1,000. Yeah, what's it? 100, I'd be like, whoa. That's what we're doing. We get like, What's Joe Rogan at? Joe Rogan's got to have a, he's got us still, right? I think he's like 10,000 mm. We already, I think we passed Fighter and the Kid though, didn't we? Did we really? I, I think, don't know. I think we did. Oh, dude, winning. Yeah. I'll look it up right now. No big deal. Yeah. All right, so we're giving out five shirts. They're going to JC Melt. 
Tony Tilt, Meg Cole 65, Ara Boy 22777, and JSNJ 19K. All of you are winners. Send the name I just read to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. Send your shirt size, your shipping address, and we'll get that right out to ya. Thanks, y'all. We got ya. Dude, do you guys have a good Easter? Oh! Hello! Do you guys Easter. have a good Easter? Did you? Uh, you know what? I really didn't do anything. Nothing? Mm. Well, I mean, I did something, but I didn't do anything for Easter, technically. So you're going to do, like, Easter Dude. bunny stuff? <laughs> well, I'm, there's no kids anymore, you know what I'm saying? All my, my siblings that have... Uh, kids or that are young enough to even do that are kind of moved away and gone. And plus, we were in Tahoe, right? So I, I went up to Tahoe with uh, Katrina and with Taylor for the weekend. Just got away. You know, we rented up, rented some nice house up in the snow and just kind of hung out, chilled out there for a little bit with nature. That's nice. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Nice. Yeah, yeah, it was nice. How about you, Justin? Yeah, I went to San Diego. Oh, yeah, you went to Legoland. Yeah. And Midway? Legoland. <laughs> really? You don't like it? Oh, it's... Dude, come on. Really? And you're a Lego guy. Lego no, I'm a was, big Lego guy, I too. like Legoland. You don't nah, like it? No, it's terrible. Why? Man. No, it's like, so just getting in there took like 45 minutes to an hour. You know, like they, they're they oh. so ineffective, inefficient. Like there's just so many things. They have like good ideas. Was there a like, of people there? So many people. That's what it is. Like, it, anyways, it was just like you get on a ride, it, it lasts all of like you know, 20 seconds and it's over. <laughs> and then you like, wait another 45 minutes to get on another. Is ride. it like a theme it's park? Yeah, yeah. It's a theme park. Oh, I didn't know that's what it was. Well, what's you- cool about it is, so they have like some areas where you can play with Legos and like the kids can kind of go do their thing and all that, which is great. And you can look at it, but it's like, they only had it at certain, um, like rides where one of them, they had it in the middle. I'm like, oh, this is brilliant. You know, like they had a great idea here. Like you're waiting in line. Your kids can just go in the middle and play with Legos till the time you're towards the front. I was like, that's a fucking brilliant idea. That was only one roller coaster they did that with. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what the fuck? Why wouldn't you do that with all of them? Yeah. You know what? It's because it's spring break. I bet you the crowd was massive. Oh, I didn't Probably yeah. sunny. Oh. May, may, yeah, th- there was probably Don't that. I don't know. I just wasn't, uh, I don't know. I guess it, it's hard to compare theme parks to Disneyland because it, they just it makes you appreciate Disney for what dude. they've done like it's so much dude it was to me it's like a glorified Gilroy Gardens you know? <laughs> wow that's what Legoland just is to me shitting on Legoland wow. right oh, now shit right, well, you know, right on top of all of it Disneyland is the that's they are the, the they create the standard oh. when it comes to organization yeah. when it comes to security oh, I don't know if you guys their do customer this. service shits on everybody. Oh, it's incredible. Everybody. Yeah. So yeah, I yeah. heard, I don't know if this is true, but I've heard it from several people and it sounds true, but I, I'm not sure if it is. It so don't quote true. me. <laughs> uh, after September 11th, I think the government went to Disney and tried to learn from them because their, their security that they do at Disneyland is incredible. Hmm. How they're able to secure the park and how they're able to do IDs and check-ins and stuff. I think that they consulted with Disneyland because it was it's so effective Dude, and so good. so efficient. I mean, yeah. just really? getting yeah. off the freeway, you park right away. Like, yeah. everything works. Bro, did you, you know? know did it's so you, weird. I would think, like, because of 9-11, they'd go somewhere like maybe the Pentagon. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, <laughs> the maybe. Pentagon got hit. You know? <laughs> They're like, yeah, Disneyland yeah. is safe. Let's yeah. go find out. What's well, going. dude, Let's go find out you what's know there's going this there. whole underground, right, at Disneyland, yeah. where, like, if something happens with a kid, they'll, sh- they'll shut the exit. Like, immediately, you tell someone, boom, they shut the exits. They've got cameras. They'll look for, you know, certain things. And there's a lot of, like, tech that they use there that people don't know well, about. Well, that'd be, you know, that's funny you bring this up. Now you're going to make me want to go down. I know, I want to check that out. The Google rabbit hole because I have never heard of someone getting kidnapped from Disneyland. And that if you're a kidnapper, that has to be one of the best places to get kidnapped. <laughs> yeah, so, you've only right? heard of like a measles outbreak like, or something. If you're a professional kidnapper, I mean, Disneyland yeah. has got to be on the list of like places to try, right? Maybe, and, and that's the thing. Or like, maybe not to fuck and with. And think about this. If you're Disneyland, you know that nothing will kill your sales like, some, like kids going missing. <laughs> like That's like the worst, yeah, right? Yeah. So they take that shit very Right, seriously. so maybe, maybe yeah, we totally. don't even know this, but Mickey and Minnie and Goofy, they're all like fucking like x Seals, yeah. you know, seals yeah. and green berets that are underneath there, right? <laughs> well, no, I've so I had a friend who had a friend who he <laughs> had a friend, turned, a friend, yeah, a friend's friend. So I don't know this person personally, he's a cousin's mother's uncle. <laughs> he he was he was with two he was with his two kids and they were both young. So I, th- I know they were both like five or maybe younger. And he turned around to tie one of his kids' shoes for like. 
10 seconds, turns back around, couldn't find his daughter oh, shit. at all. At Disneyland? Oh at God. Disneyland. Panic. Panic. Looks, looks, looks. And he knows, like, he's like, okay, I'm going to tell someone right away. This is what you should do, by the way. If you can't find your kid, it's just better safe than sorry. So he told one of the uh, the people that works there, all the entrances locked down immediately. They were looking for the kid and they saw, and this is what I heard through, you know, another, another person. So I, I didn't talk to this person directly, but... He told the, the, the people, this is, what clo- this is what her shoes look like. This is what her jacket looked like. And there was someone walking with, like, holding the kid and covering them. And all they could see was the shoes, like, trying to kidnap his kid. And they saw it on the cameras and caught the no guy. No way. Yeah. That's wow. the story I heard. So I don't know. Really? Yeah. But their security is supposed to be, like, yeah. insane. But they're super organized. Obviously. Disneyland all day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they also have a lot of people. Way that, worth it. A lot of people that are working there that are, like, undercover working there. I don't know if you know that. So they no, have, I didn't know that. Yeah, so this I do know. So they have a lot of people that are that blend into the crowd, but that are or that are employees. So you have, of course, you have some employees that are name tagged and they're there to do certain jobs. But then they also have employees that are working just to help with the experience that are paying attention to like customer service and helping people. So like that's kind of their way to. I'm to, like, man, people at Disneyland are so nice. This random guy just gave me directions, dude. And, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> Remember, I told you guys we for totally. my sister's thirtieth. That's what she wanted to do. So that's not. I mean, God, now it's. God, we're getting old. It was five years ago now. So five years ago, we went. We went there, and I remember like from the moment we per- pulled up to the parking lot. Like we pulled up. Now I'm thirty something at this. Thirty two at this time, right? And 31 at this time. And I hadn't been to Disneyland since 1999 when I graduated high school. And so I didn't remember. I don't remember. And I was a young, dumb, drunk high school kid when I was at there, the fucking high school thing. So I'm not paying attention to customer service. And it's in the middle of the night. So it wasn't the same. So I really haven't been there since I was like a child. So I don't remember that experience. Now I'm here I'm coming as a 30 year old adult. Right. We roll up to the the, you know, the first like little gate to get into the parking lot. And the guy like. You know, asked, he's like, oh, if, you know, is this your first time here? I'm like, no, we've been here, but I haven't been here since I was a kid, you know, and the guy, so he gets out of a, you know, they're in those little tool booth looking things or whatever. He gets out, you know, walks around to the car, pulls up a map of all of Disneyland and says, you know, where are you go? And he just starts asking all these questions about what we're doing and you want to go here and check yeah. this out. They'll help you out here. If you need any help with this, go to this person. And they'll say this to you. If you need anything for here, this or that, anything else I can do for you? And we're like, this is the guy getting our, letting us into the parking lot. Yeah. And I'm like, whoa, dude, like that was like, well, you pay for all that service too. Cause that is expensive, man. When you go to Disneyland, yeah. you're, if you go with two kids, like two, you and your wife and two kids, you're going to spend a lot of damn money. How much is a ticket don't you, there now? It's like almost 200 something, right? For one. Yeah. It's in, well, that's to go to the other. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's expensive. I don't know. I, but I mean, it's you, worth it. I was going to say, do you guys in think it's worth it? Yes, yeah, yeah. dude. I do. Like, I do. Uh, it's just, I mean, the, thankfully the kids loved Legoland, right? So that was all that mattered. But like, it is not, it was not set up for for adults or to, or to be efficient. Like, even, you know how they have fast passes at like uh, Disneyland? Yeah. So they have... <laughs> They do like this nickel and dime thing. We have to buy these like I don't know what they are. They're like they're they're little like tags that you have to like upgrade to be able to get on. And and you, you each person has to buy one, and they're like an extra like twenty five fifty bucks each, it's to, just to be able to get on these rides and uh, not wait in the line and all that kind of stuff. Which is like you know if it was like just me and one other person, it might make sense, you know. And if I really like Legoland, but the waiting in line with two kids, dude. <laughs> You know, it's really cool to see examples of this in business. I think they're so neat because I remember being a kid going to Disneyland and being a kid and going to Great America. And when you look at where both those companies are now and what they charge to get, I mean, Great America gives away access. Mm -hmm. Like when I was a kid, Great America was like $60 to get access. And then you had like a season pass. We used to get season passes Mm -hmm. for like four or $500 or something crazy. Like their season pass now is like eighty nine dollars or a hundred and something bucks, and you have a season pass to go to Great America whenever you want. And they so they had to play the price game of just like lowering, 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 lowering. They, lowering. they just charge everything else in the park. Well, you know, it's not, it's not even that. It's just that it's they're struggling to keep people there. It's just like the water parks. Mm-hmm. We used to have a big water park by where I used to grow up, and it shut down just because people start going. They get nasty. They get run down. Like I mean, Great America's turned into kind of kind of trashy, dude. Yeah, it is. Yeah. When we were kids, it wasn't. It was it really wasn't that bad. No, uh, it wasn't. It was, it was the jam. It was the jam, like, man. It was it was a cool, Top Gun. I don't know. Right. That came it, out. it was, was a it was, was awesome. a cool place to be. And it's, it's not. Got, is it Great America still? Is it or is it, oh, it's Six Flags Great America. Six Flags. Oh, yeah. yeah, and it's just it's a little ghetto now. It's not as yeah. it's not as nice anymore. And you see what's happening. They've had to play the price wars game, and then you see a company like Disneyland, who's 
I remember going to Disneyland for a lot cheaper. I was under hundred dollars a ticket when I went when I was a kid. Like and now oh, look yeah. where it's at. I mean it's they've been able Bro, to go look raise at, their prices. Go look at staying at the Disneyland hotels. I stay there. That's where we stay yeah. for the third. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was, oh, that'll kill you. That was, yeah. That'll break the bank. Well, that was. The, it's one of those things. That's, if you're going to plan this big trip with your kids and stuff and make it memorable and whatever, it's. It, I think it should be worth it, right? It should be. Yeah. Well, with your kids, you're already kind of trying to manage everything, and it's chaotic and this and that. So it's like it's nice when it's all already thought of for you. You know, so it's yeah. like it's worth it a lot of times when you go on that level. But yeah, That's- we also went to this um, with this brunch. Uh, the, uh, in San Diego for for Easter, which was great, but it was like I started to I don't know it was something about brunch and like buffets like it just doesn't rub me the right way. It's just like everybody's just fucking gorgeous out. It's disgusting. <laughs> I just like I can't stand watching people like like oh I gotta like earn my money's worth and like stack plates and fucking eat like like a fat fuck dude have you have you been <laughs> when's the last just time you went to a oh, it's just gross when you when's the last time you've been into like a hometown buffet that's what it, oh. dude buffets need to die oh it's like why why not enjoy food you know just a nice like oh my god this is the best thing this, i've ever had versus like i just had a fucking you know a pound you know five pounds of steak and eggs and crammed in some brownies and all kinds of the, other the, shit the, the the that's the selling point the selling point is all you can eat you know what I mean? It's, so that's just, why you go there. Disgusting, dude. dude. I used to go buffet. to a hometown buffet post workout. That was like one of my. That was one of my jams, <laughs> dude. Yeah, home. I mean, uh, buffet style and all you can eat sushi are like two no nos for me. That's like no, absolutely not. Ugh. I'm not going to. All eat All you it. can eat sushi just doesn't sound right. No, yeah. it doesn't. I remember my. So I remember this is my. No, that's absolutely. I remember wrong. like the, uh, one of the last times I went to sushi with one of my buddies, and he who claims to love sushi, and he took me to his place, and we get there and sit down, and it's like. All you can eat sushi. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? All the amazing sushi places we have in the Bay Area, and you take me to an all you can eat sushi? <laughs> Bro, do you not understand how they can even do that? Like, let me break this down for you real quick. Like, yeah. There's like three levels of like sushi, like the sous chefs can like order, right? Or whoever the fuck owns the company, right? Orders to do there. And you, they pay less money when they do the buffets or do the all you can eat. They can't, af- you can't afford fresh off the boat that morning to your, to your place. You know, type of uh, sushi for you know that cheap of a price. You just would go out of business. So what they do is they get the lower grade sushi so they can do that. And so we're eating shittier sushi. Like I know it before I even bite into it. You idiot! Like you know, it's like, no, it's not fucking good. It doesn't work that yeah, way. Yeah, the quality has to go down. Like, you to can't convince me. The you can't convince me how good it's, it's, like, uh, it's like gas station sushi. sushi. <laughs> yeah, 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 for totally. real, dude. Oh, like, they, got, they got sushi at Chevron. What a good idea. Yeah, that's a delicious. That's five dollars. Like, yeah. No, I took so for for our spring break. We did, we did have a good idea. Yeah, uh, a time. Though. So you did that. You did. Yeah. What did you guys do? Anything else or just? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, we also went to opening day for the San Diego Padres, which was a lot of fun. Oh, they that's actually, cool. You were there for opening day. Yeah, they had like what was cool is it's like nobody really takes baseball seriously there, so oh. it's like all about like the ambiance and like so they had all this stuff set up for kids to kind of like hit wiffle balls and stuff you know in the back and that's smart um yeah it was very family friendly and so yeah we had a great time the thing is dude even you know the buffet all that like legoland we still had a great time i had a great time hanging out with my kids and stuff so and then they just like played in the sand and you know went to the beach and dug up a bunch of what was the temp up there it was like 75 pretty much the whole time (laughs) Yeah. I, th- I thought it was so crazy because I was so watching chill. your Insta story and you're in like 75, 78 degrees and I'm over in like 40 <laughs> degrees and we're in the same state. All snow. So yeah. I love our, that's why I love California. Like where in California can you and your buddy, you know, drive different directions on in the state and then one of us is up in the snow. Bro, and you, you, you're one to two hours away from snow or beach, right? Yeah. you know, warm or cold or whatever you Dude, it's awesome. So, yeah. what'd, what'd you what'd you so do, Sal? We took so I wanted to do. You just hiked somewhere. Yeah, so I wanted to do like different. I wanted to do hikes each day with my kids, and and we just do the whole experience. So we bought them Camelbacks, and I got them hiking shoes, and I prepped because my daughter's eight. So you know, hiking with an eight year old is a little <laughs> that's going to be challenging, right? Because right. she's got little legs. So like if you know <laughs> we hike you know four miles, that's like. You know, twenty for her right. tiny little. Did you have to carry her at all? No, so at any point? so we had a conversation beforehand. So first off, getting the gear really pumped them both up. But my son's twelve, so he's cool. Mm-hmm. But for my eight year old, she got really excited. So she's like, "Oh, I get to carry my own water." And I'm like, "Yeah." And the day before, we're gonna go to the grocery store. I want you to pick out what you're gonna eat for lunch because halfway through the hike, we're gonna stop and we're gonna make a picnic. 
So the the deal was she got to pick whatever she wants. So she picked fucking Lunchables. Can you believe that shit? <laughs> Watching watch my daughter eat course. Lunchables. It feels like she's smoking a cigarette right in front of her. You know what I mean? I was like, oh. Like, mm, nasty meat yeah. and processed and, cheese. Oh, yeah. and all, of all things too. You know what? That's something you should, you know what? What a good example though of like, this oh, is this is the, bar, choice, the, yeah. the bartering piece though, right? Yeah, too. It's yeah, like, yeah. okay, you know, she's going to do something like this. I, just, I don't want to make, you know, it, make it, it extra hard, right? I'm not yeah. trying to make it so taboo that, you know what I mean? That she ends up rebelling and stuff. So I want her to know like, I told her, you can pick whatever you want uh, as long as it's within reason. And she picked, you know, and of course, of all the Lunchables, she picks the pizza one. I'm like, God, not only are you getting <laughs> disgusting Lunchables, but you're like disgracing our heritage. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even pizza. But anyway, so, oh, so they double picked, slap. They got to pick their own food. She's all Did psyched. Did have pineapple she had, on it? No. Okay, at least yeah, that, that would have been like the draw, right? No. Well, this you, is not what you can too far. Yeah, too far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she got the shoes. We got the camel back. So and then, all, you know, bef- the day before I have a conversation with them, I'm like, okay, so this is what hiking is like. It's difficult. It's going to be challenging. We're going to be tired. And then Jessica taught me a while ago this term called type two fun. Have you guys heard of this? Yeah, you shared it on the podcast. <laughs> Did I share that with you guys mm-hmm. a while? So I didn't. I never knew that before. So type two fun is when- it's delayed gratification. Yeah, while you're doing something, it's not necessarily enjoyable. It's afterwards when you think about it and be like, wow, that was really cool. And hard hikes tend to be like that, right? While you're doing them, you're hot and you're sweating and you're tired. But then afterwards, you're like, you're so happy that you did it. So I explained that to them. I said, look, this is going to be type two fun. While you're doing it, it's going to be really challenging. I said, but I, I, I actually, I think you guys are ready for this. And I told my daughter, I said, I think you can make this the entire way. I'm really, I think you're strong enough. I think you have enough persistence. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get her all psyched up. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm trying yeah, to pump, yeah. pump her up. So the first day we went to the Pinnacles and it was hot up there. It was actually 85, wow. which is wow. Holy pretty, shit. yeah, which is pretty hot to hike. It's a pretty, it's a pretty decent temperature for hiking. So we started our hike. We did six miles with the kids <laughs> of a hike and it was a lot of climbing and it was a lot of this different stuff. And I could just, my daughter's just poor little kid, you know, she's drinking her water through a camel back and every once in a while she's like, I need to stop right now. And so I'll be like, okay, so I'll sit down. She'll stop. And I'll be like, what's the matter? She's like, my legs hurt. I'll be like, okay. I'll be like, well, we need to go again. We're taking too long. She'll be like, okay. And so we'll keep going. So we were like maybe a mile or three quarters of a mile away from this one particular cave that I wanted them to see. But the, they were fried. She was fried. She's sitting down. She's like, I don't, I, I don't think I can go anymore. You might have to carry me. She's getting all like. <laughs> yeah. And so I told him, I said, well, I said, we've went this entire way. I said, you're going to miss the most important part, but I'll leave it up to you. You could totally do it if you want. I said, but, you know, I, I said, you know, champions tend to want to finish, you know. So if you want to be one of those kind of people. <laughs> so I give this speech, right? And so, and then I do the takeaway clothes. So then we're like, all right, guys, let's just head back. We're, we're going to miss it. And so then my daughter stands up. She's like, no, we're going to go. We're going to do this. And she like starts taking off. So I'm so proud. So we get to the very end. Then we're on our way back. It's hot. Everybody's sweating. Probably, I'm not even lying. Like, how far would it be from here to like the front of our of our facility? Not here, but the front of the facility. Oh, the front of uh, 50 yards. Maybe 50 yeah. yards. Right. 50 yards away was the car. So we go around the bend. And now you can see our car. That's when she loses her shit. Because now she can see, uh, it makes it all me, comes crashing, bro. In. It reminds me yeah. of when you ever have to go like to the bathroom so bad, and you're holding it, and then when you see the toilet, that's when you're like, yeah, go yeah, quick. You just right. literally can't handle it yeah. anymore. So she, she sees the car about fifty yards away, and then she starts losing her shit, bro. <laughs> she starts losing her mind. I can't do. I, just, I don't know if I can anymore. I'm like, uh, the car's right knees there. Start knocking together. I'm like, you can <laughs> see the car. It's right there, but I can't. I don't know what I'm feeling right now. Something. I'm feeling something. <laughs> she doesn't even have words to put like what she can feel. But we finally get there, and you know. Uh, we're, yeah, we How was your car. son? He did no That's problem. Huh? No problem. Then the next day we went to Wilder Ranch, which mm-hmm. is, uh, you know where that is? Yeah. Dude, yeah, I didn't nice. even know that place existed. Yeah. Like Mustang awesome. Ranch? No, so it's not, no, it's not a brothel. <laughs> <laughs> They're too young for that. <laughs> hey kids. So what kind of trip yeah. was this? Yeah. We went, uh, no, it's a hike along the coast and you, it's a bunch of cliffs and it's gorgeous. And there's one part where you can hike down and go to like this Secluded beach, and then you could see. Were all these, these all like in the same vicinity, or each day you drove? No, to a these are one? different, different days. This is up Highway One, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you could see sea lions and stuff. Mm-hmm. So then we did. Oh that well, that's the neat. Day. So each day you kind of planned a different hike. Oh. We planned a different hike, and and the kids were just. We had a great time. We got home, and everybody slept real good that night. Of course, because they were. They exhausted. ran back a second hike even after the first. Second one. day, yep, yep. She what, wasn't too sore the next day. They huh? were sore. They were for sure sore. And so then I explained to them of how fun, uh, what uh, I gave my daughter the talk about or both my kids about. Um, 
uh, active recovery and how that's good for your legs and stuff like that. So, I'm, you know, the whole time what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to empower them to feel like, because it's, you know, it's the cha- it's, it's challenging as hell for a little kid, especially deconditioned kids. And let's be honest, most kids nowadays are, even yeah. if they play sports, they're just, uh, they're just not conditioned. The, 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 that moment will pay you tenfold down the road. I guarantee that. But it's so, someone who never hiked with like his family or did anything like that, like I just didn't care to do it ever until someone finally got and I was like, ah, hike? Fuck you. I'm not hiking. I have no desire to hike. Mm-hmm. Until I had someone actually make me do it. Now Katrina and I do this all the time. It's like one of my favorite things to do. It's how you frame it, you know? It's how you frame it for your kids. So, you know, I'm framing it with like, I'm talking about nature. I'm talking about grounding. I'm talking about, you know, the benefits of it. We're away from electronics and this is what electronics do to you. And um, and then the challenge aspect of it. And afterwards, you know, after the first and second hike, I made, I gave them a speech and I said, I am really, I said, yes, there was some complaining, but I'm really proud of what you did. And then I told my daughter, I said, you know, we hiked six miles, but for you, that's like eight miles because your legs are so small. I said, so I'm really proud of you. Make sure to tell your friends what you did. And so you could tell she was kind of, you know, pumped up about it or whatever. And, and it, you know, and then we had the Easter party at my aunt's house. And then she gets this big, really complicated Lego set that no way she would have ever done on her own because she gets too frustrated. But I think the hike kind of gave her this mentality where I'm going to overcome. So the, then the other morning she puts together this Lego set and it's definitely some frustrating moments, but then she figured out on her own and she was super, and it was really cool. And you know, watching that, I was thinking about how we talk so much about how challenge is what gives life meaning and how it's the process, it's not the goal. And it dawned on me. What better example of that is than than Legos? You just went to Legoland. Mm-hmm. How many Legos would they fucking sell if they sold it already made for you, like glued together? Here's oh, your I here's know. your toy. No, they'd sell none. There's nothing. Right. Yeah, there's nothing there's there. Nothing to it. As the, when you're done, that's it's over. The fun part is is the Building. process. Right. Yeah. This is that you can apply this to to your fitness when you're thinking about your your. And I thought about this as I'm watching her, and I'm looking at this. I'm like, <clears> it's it's definitely challenging for her. She's having a tough time. But no way would she have nearly as much fun or enjoy herself or have any meaning if I just gave her the toy made all well, put together. That's interesting you put that together because I've also kind of had that moment where like they're they're in the moment of like building something out of the Legos. And uh, my son, is he's very, very good about uh, going through the directions and like building it all the way to the end and completion and shows me. I'm like, it's awesome. It's great. But uh, I start to challenge him a little bit on like, I want to see something from your own mind. I want you to create something that doesn't exist, you know, like something that you want to make, like a some kind of a spaceship, like show me something, some like, and so he's been really like challenging himself to come up with ideas, and like he's he's built some of the most crazy things I've I've ever seen, like, uh, and and like on I I got him this Lego table and everything, and he built this whole fortress. Uh, for all of these little guys that, that we got them and uh, started to make like little stop motion film with them battling. So it's just crazy to watch like the creative spark kind of happen, you know, just by just trying like in, intentionally to to really work on expressing that. Do you see yeah. a difference between yeah. each boy, like as far as like who's more creative than the other? Is there a big um, well, difference? Yeah, right now, I mean, Ethan's older, and so he's like, he's really kind of coming into his own as far as like, um, like having creative ideas and like expressing. And he's very, he's very builder kind of motivated. Like he loves building Legos and showing them, and like, um, he's really into. Like, of course, he's really into war and stuff because he's a boy. And e- Ethan's the one that's less into sports, right? Yeah, he's less. He's less. Than, he's he's more into sports to hang out with his friends and, and like the he's experience of it. Nah, not at all. Yeah, and then Everett on the other end of it is totally more of the competitive. Like, and I think too that being the younger, like less. Like he's always trying to be stronger than Ethan. Like trying to pick him up and like trying mm-hmm. to out wrestle him. And so he's like very, very much more com- competitive. And now this is rare that this happens, but sometimes you see this in families where like the younger brother ends up being bigger and kind of tougher. Do you foresee him kind of being that, like as they get older, like he's going to be kind of that badass? And like, um, yeah, it could happen. I mean, that's what happened with me and my brother. So you know, it was kind of. Oh, that, so you're calling your older brother pussy right now? Is what you you're know, saying? I just I kind of dominate 
in, in everything, you know, every sport that existed. I, I hope he's listening. So, uh, well, except for ping pong, but who cares about that? You know? <laughs> it's like a real sport, bro. Yeah. You need hella like, but, angry uh, messages. I mean, he can read like way more books than me, you know? Good job. <laughs> he can read more books than he can play yeah, ping pong. Yeah, he can play he can ping pong. Yeah. He's got that on me, I but that's it. about it. Yeah. 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 It's tough to tell with young kids, too, because a lot of times they, they change as they get totally. older. Like my youngest, yeah. uh, my youngest sister was just this insane little rascal that would climb things and cry and she was stubborn as fuck and for sure everybody was like oh when she's a teenager you guys are screwed and then the other my other younger sister was a super quiet timid played with dolls like kind of did everything she was told and everybody's like oh she's gonna be so easy and then when they became teenagers it was like they swapped totally swapped my young the one who's the crazy one yeah was like at home all the time reading and super quiet and then my other sister was like the party animal going crazy and it's just, it's funny. So you never know. You yeah, know you I mean? never know. That's the thing. It's just speculating. Yeah. yeah. You, you, I could kind of see like one versus the other. But yeah, you, you never know. It might switch Dude, at some point. Speaking of creativity, did you guys watch Ready Player One? No, I haven't watched. No, don't not even, do don't not talk about, about that. I'm not going to ruin it for I do you. Really not talk about I'm just right going to say this right now. <laughs> instant classic. Oh, really? I, instant movie of the year. Instant classic. Hundred percent. I mean, dude, I well, has all the movie. elements that I love. Well, no, right, from I, here I'll, I'll say this. I'm not going to trust day. me. I won't give it away. But the guy dies at the end. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. No, 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 no. That's not what happened. I won't give it away. But uh, it has, it has the same instant classic feel that, um, like the Goonies mm. or. Uh, Back to the Future. Oh wow, weird, you know, really? weird, weird ones for you to compare to. No, you, okay, you'll know when you watch it. Okay. Well, like, Steven Spielberg directed it, right? Yes. Well, you know when you watch those movies the first time, it's he not, did it, Back to the Future, didn't he? It's yeah, that, yeah, he also yeah. did ET and yes, like, yeah, it has that everything. feel where you watch it and you instantly want to watch it again. Yeah. Where it's like it's this adventure. It's like all this great stuff. So much pop culture, by the way, references. Justin, yeah, I have to watch oh, it with okay. you. All right, because I'm as in. I'm watching, my kids didn't recognize half the stuff. <laughs> but as I'm watching, I'm like, oh my god, that's that. That's that. That's, oh, that's a, that they're alluding to this, and they're it's like I have to watch it. Like, well, four that's times. so good. Maybe we should all go to watch it again. Even though I'm down. Seen, yeah, yeah we should. Do it. We should all go because I I've been waiting. Field trip. I've been waiting for the traffic to slow down on it because it's so it was so popular. Bro, it's, go to Oak Ridge and get the reserve seating. I know. I was doing that anyways, yeah. dude. The reserve seatings were filling up two two those recliner yeah. seats. Dude. Oh, they got they those have now. Seat they have those up in Santa Cruz. They have seat heaters yeah. too. Oh sweet! Yeah, so you just lay back. Although I will knock them a little bit because I might fall. Asleep. Of all the recliners, they're kind of the the cheesier, cheap ones. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But they're still a fucking ten times better than what was in there Way before. Better. And the fact that you can reserve the seats now is dope because that's cool. I like that a Way lot. Way so. better. Yeah. I, that, hey, speaking of shows and I'm stuff, do it. Are you watching Billions yet? Are you watching Billions? No, yet? Don't, I don't watch yeah. That. Okay. So I, that's in my queue, and I just started watching Silicon Valley. But Billions was the one that oh, I was like, dude, oh, so excited about. Sal, that you're show. the only one that hasn't got because I know Doug watches that. I show. love that show. Are you the only one that doesn't watch that show? I don't watch it. No, I don't Bro, have arguably showtime. my favorite show. Right? Yeah. I mean, and this season is coming out fine. Is it on really? Hulu? I wonder if they have it on Sweet. Hulu. Well, it's on Showtime, so you won't get it for you free. Gotta, well, you got to like go all the way from the beginning, though, man. That, that oh, yeah, show. definitely oh, start, start at the beginning. That's yeah. a, it's fucking it's a must. fire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it? Also, hear about uh, Channing, You'll love it. Channing Tatum, right? Or Tatum, whatever his fucking name is, right? Ch yeah, he's a uh, ladies. He's single now. Ch oh, he's oh, divorced? Divorced. Sweet. Seven year marriage, yeah. I guess some Nine year. Nine is nine. nine. Year he, he knew that. Yeah. He is a catch. <laughs> he yeah. I tend to follow. Yeah. Chaining, you know. Shanning. We were, tax, we were texting him. the other day. He's, he's going him. through a tough time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't give a fuck. I do remember. I read a headline. I remember it said nine years. That's all. Oh, uh, okay. Look at you, dude. Oh, brother. That boy can move. <laughs> Who cares? You know what I mean? yeah. what? That's stupid. Hey, anyway. kill, he crushed Magic Mike, dude. Yeah. That was, I don't uh, watch that. You didn't watch it? No. Dude. I watched See, it I even of, heard. So the the I older guy was the, the guy with like the kind of silvery hair. Was oh, my, the one that was the my older brother. The hit of that yeah. movie, not even him. Oh yeah, that's what I heard. Kachina actually knows knows who the movie was based on and everything. Knows the guy. Oh, it was yeah. like a real thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. How does she know? Of course, because she was in the the stripper industry at one time. <laughs> She's she so, wasn't a stripper. She's going to get so mad I said that. Yeah, she's no. going to get so mad. She, she, oh, really? She's going to get mad I sold her out, too. She dated a, a male stripper at one point. Wow. Yeah. 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 I mean, <laughs> obviously helps her put up with my bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's... this. So <laughs> Like, hey, if you had to deal with me, that's nowhere near as bad as having a stripper for one. It's always right. Whenever she gets mad at me, I'm like, you could have a stripper for a boyfriend. That's right. Things could be worse. You take you, you know to dinner with a bunch of wrinkly ones. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Slap on the table. All sweaty. Yeah. That's so disgusting. Yeah, oh, no. I, for, I, did, I did do something else. I went to go watch the Cirque. 
Cirque du Soleil here in San Jose. Oh yeah, at the arena. Yeah, dude, awesome. you you should have gone. You missed it. Danny and my cousin were there. They actually went on I love on, on Sunday to to the, the. It was the first time it's ever been on ice. On right, ice. that was a big deal. So Jessica, when she was traveling with the Cirque, she was a guardian. Her job was to be a guardian for um, one of the young uh, performers. So when they have a performer that's under eighteen, they have a guardian that's with them that watches over them, makes sure that you know makes make sure that they go they take their classes and do other stuff and not do other things and so the girl that she was a guardian for you know is now an adult and is now one of the main characters in Sir. oh wow so we got to watch this girl do so she's so the the name of the show is crystal so she plays crystal at the very end so for people who watch the show at the very end there's a, a version of crystal because the whole show is taking you through this girl's life and she plays the version of crystal that does this these crazy aerial moves on a trapeze with another dude like extremely extremely dangerous crazy ridiculous mobility and and body awareness type of stuff it's just as a trainer watching this i'm looking at the stuff that they're doing Mm -hmm. and it's mind-blowing like these there were guys on on ice skates that were doing like crazy flips and shit in the back and throwing each other in the air and then landing on their skates what? in the ice. That's yeah, so and, I mean, if you fall, you're done. That's so right. You're not going to make it, you know? Then there was this one guy, and I think it's called the straps, but he hangs by one arm on the strap, so it's just his left arm the entire time, hanging his body, and he's spinning and twisting and holding on to other people and flipping, and then at one point, his arm is behind his back in, like, basically in jujitsu, it's like a chimera. Like, this is how you break someone's arm. That's how he's suspending his body. In the in the thing and spinning and I'm like how the shoulder mobility and strength of this guy is so insane. How can Damn, he do that? Dude. I have a question. I hope for he you. switches it up like each performance. I don't. Know, I like, asked her that. Arm, yeah. I said, do they switch it up? And she goes, uh, no, highly unlikely. It's That's you're so crazy, specialized. Dude. Well, think about the yeah, skill yeah. involved. No, you're yeah. so specialized that you probably don't have the time. You're right to practice the it other. Would arm, make sense. Right? You know? But man, that, have you ever asked her? Toll. I've always been curious to like how well. They all get paid in like, like very obviously, well. obviously, if you're the main event, you get paid decent very money. Very well. Really? Very well. Well, tell me what's the. So, what's, the, I don't know the what break? the average salaries are um, specifically, but here's. here's like, tell me thing. like what an entry level person makes. I, then, I don't know. I'll ask her that. Okay. Uh, but I do know that they make, I know a lot of them make more than six figures, but here's the deal like you're, uh, you're traveling with the circus. So, if you're a performer, if you're a gymnast or. You know, you, let's say you do small cir- uh, circuses in Europe because there's a lot of shows that are around the world. They're just not nearly as well known. But yeah, but the cir- if you're for the Cirque, I mean, that's a- if you that's the top of the line. Right. Uh, you make a lot of money. They pay for your housing. They pay for a lot of your food. So not only do you make good money, but you don't spend any of it. Uh, be, you don't have to spend any of it because you don't usually you're don't have traveling a car. with them everywhere. You travel with them everywhere. Now, the, the, the one that uh, Jessica did was she would travel to different countries and she would stay for three weeks at a time. So three to like five weeks. I think the, I think the longest she stayed was in Brazil was I think a few months, but that's because they went to different parts of Brazil because the Cirque in Brazil is incredibly popular. But this one, this arena tour that they're doing, they're staying like one week at a time. Mm. So but so that can be kind of strenuous. But they, you know, great medical, great everything. They, they, if you're a kid, they give you school. So they'll provide your school. So these people will go for five years, eight years, nine years traveling with the Cirque, and then they'll leave and we'll have a shit ton of money that they just saved while they were so doing what it. So right, they can't really spend it. Yeah. So what yeah. was it that drove Jess from it? Why didn't she not want to keep doing it? I didn't, I didn't realize it was good money. I assumed that it wasn't. I thought it was like one of those things that it's just more- Oh, of- no, no, no. You get paid. You know who gets paid the most, she told me? The, uh, the clowns and the singers get paid the most. What? Yeah. I did not realize that. Clowns? So, yeah. So the people who- So if you go to a Cirque show, and this is- and I may be getting some of this wrong because we've had lots of conversations, but I'm pretty sure she said that. So if you ever go to a Cirque show, you see the live singers who are you know singing during the shows and many yeah. of these. Mm-hmm. She said they get paid quite a bit. And then the clowns, and the clowns, I guess it's because here's something I didn't know. So when we went to the show, she, she was talking to her friend who, you know, the girl that she used to guard in, you know, b- before the show. And her friend said, oh, the second act uh, after uh, intermission <laughs> had to get changed so you know something else is going to be thrown in the middle and so i asked her i said how often does that happen and she's like all the time if a prop breaks if someone gets sick or something happens on the fly they change the show so you could watch a show two nights in a row and you'll notice like different things right so they, it's just like mm. sports where they have a bunch of backup plays like in case you gotta call an audible you have to right and so a big job of the clown is to make up 
for some of the stuff or right, to entertain the, the, the transition, crowd. Sort transition, of entertain the crowd. Mm. Clowns have lots of different skills. Oh, so there's a lot of responsibility on them to Tons like, of manage the show versus just someone who specializes in swinging and flipping. And it's like, that's your yeah. one trick. That's yeah. what you do. And, yeah. and oh, it, that makes sense. But it's extremely, mm. it's extremely So dangerous. why did Jess leave? You didn't tell me why it was. Oh, well, think about it this way, dude. If you're living at a hotel, uh, you're traveling, in, constantly traveling. You don't have any solid base. At some point, you might, and maybe some people don't, but some people might be like, look, I, I, I'm kind of over it now. I want to stay in one place. I want to... Because can, I can imagine how exhausting it well, could be. Well, is that what it was for her? She was just over it? They or? were over it. She was married at the time. They wanted to leave and kind of just you know start a regular were they, life or whatever. Her husband and her... Him? Her husband was a performer. Oh, wow. Yeah, he was uh, one of the bases uh, for Verikai, which was uh, a show that ran for like 10 years or whatever. But it's... Uh, the amount of training they do and, and what goes behind... like. You you see the people in the show, but there is there are so many employees and staff that put that together. Oh, who, well, obviously, especially right. the tents. Like they have to or, they have to put the tents up. They have to put up the food. It's like they build every time they a move. City. They build a city. Yeah, a little they hundred percent. They they bring their doctors with them. They bring so there's all the stat trainers, physical therapists, like teachers for the school. So. It's a huge production. It's pretty crazy. I want. Do you know, like roughly? I would say the last one I went to, it's probably a couple thousand uh, people watch at a time. Well, the one in the arena, the ones in the arenas mm. are massive. Oh wait, that was an SAP. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah so that's seven. That's seventeen thousand people. Yeah, it was full. Wow. Yeah. And they're there for a week. Yeah, they were there for a week. And they do a week, week seven Damn. shows. Yeah. Then. Yep. Wow, yeah, yeah. that's bang, yeah, dude! Yeah. And those tickets are over a hundred dollars. Some of them are more. To get oh, way just, more depending on how. Where you yeah, sit. yeah. It's minimum. It's like one fifteen. Yeah. It's know a that. massive organization. It's based out of Canada, um, and uh, it is like again, if you're if if you're if you're an acrobat or you're in gymnast or you know you're that kind of a performer, like these circuses or the circus, like one of the you know one of the pinnacles. Like that's where you can go professional. Because her friend. Or the girl that she that she was the guardian for was a national. I think she got second in the world at the age of eleven or twelve for the UK. So she was a top top level gymnast, and then she got recruited uh, by the Cirque. And her when she what she did at Verikai was she was like her. So Jessica's husband was the one of the bases, and this young girl who she was guardian for was this girl that they would throw up in the air. And do all these crazy flips and stuff. And she was doing it. She was like 15 years old, right? Like a flyer, like a cheerleader. Yeah, flyer, yeah, right? but just crazy stuff. <clears throat> right, right. And it, but it's extremely dangerous. I mean, for the past three years, they've had a uh, one death each year, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, the, the last one. Uh, That's really when you think about how because the staffs. I mean, it's big, but it's not fucking huge. It's not like a company of 10,000 people. If one person dies every year, that's a fuck. That's crazy. Well, before that, there were no deaths for like 15 years. So they've had a string now. It's been pretty bad, and the 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 last two deaths I were were during a, a live show, I believe. What? Yeah. So Dude. yeah, one of them were the, the, it was a God. What was he doing? I can't remember. Uh, she told me all about it, but anyway, the guy was he was really high, and his body went. Si oh, he was doing the straps, I think, and somehow let go, or the strap didn't wasn't secured, and just landed on his head on the ground. Oh, shit. Yeah, in front of everybody. <laughs> hey, but here's the thing you want to consider because she was she was very sad about it, and she barely knew the guy. She she knew of him, but she says, yeah, when stuff like that happens, you're you're if you're with a show, and you're one of the main performers or whatever, or any what doesn't matter. A lot of these people will stay for years, three, four, five, ten years, and they'll travel with one show. So her friend who's doing Crystal will probably do Crystal until. That show was done, which will be, you know, who knows how long it'll be, seven years, 10 years or whatever, right? right? You're traveling with the same, you know, 300 people for 10 years or five years. Like that is your family. Like right. everything you do, you travel every, you know. So when somebody, when something like that happens, it's absolutely I wonder. Devastating. I wonder how many relationships are within that because you're traveling with them, you're living with them. There's, Everybody, tons. It's like everyone's husband oh, yeah. or wife is. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. My Lots wife, of people marry each other. My wife met. is the the bearded lady over there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh yeah, right. No beard ladies. No. No. But I mean, and so the cool thing was because because Jess oh, traveled man. with them for so long, she did I think five years. She entered into that not really having she had no experience with acrobatics no experience with any stuff was just traveling with her husband ends up working for them uh, while she was there and then because she made friends with everybody she got trained on her uh, on how to do the silks and on flexibility by like the best in the world you know what i mean these are like the best acrobats and coaches in the world and because she came, became friends with them they would just train her and teach her for free so within like four or five years she became like this badass silks you know, performer and got all oh, those crazy Oh, wow. So she wasn't even initially there for that. 
Bro, she couldn't even. No, not at all. No, oh, no, that's no, crazy. no, 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 no. She was, she was just because she was married to the guy who to her oh, husband. Oh, I didn't know that. See, mm-hmm. I thought maybe they both did that. No. They met there and mm-hmm. then started. Oh, he was involved in it first, yep. and because she was around it uh-huh. all the time, she got trained, became really good, and then she actually got super. The tra- bro, she said she could, she could barely touch her toes beforehand. Now she could do the splits in the silks with one leg on either side. Dang. And because she got trained by like these crazy Russian like acrobats. She, which that would make her cry. She's. Like, I was gonna say. <laughs> like, like, oh yeah, one of those methods. Oh yeah, she said it's brutal, right? Oh yeah, they, yeah. she said they were. They would fucking it's like some of that. I've old, seen like old some Chinese school. clips of uh, yeah them them training some. It's of like the uh, gymnasts. Old, old school Van Dam where you tie your legs between the two palm trees. You know what I'm mm, saying? Let mm. the palm trees spread your legs out apart like that. You remember that scene? Yep. Yeah, uh, that's a great movie. <laughs> by the way, uh, is that so, blood sport? Is it blood? Sport? That was uh, kickboxer. Oh, was that kickboxer? That was kickbo- that's the one where he goes. He's getting trained by like the 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 Thai the Thai uh, you know the old Thai coach or whatever. Yes. And he's kind of going for a jog and he's you know, kind of going. If slow. He's so flexible. It's yeah. like I don't believe it. No, I don't no. believe there's any power behind those kicks. Uh, depend, dude. Actually, Van Dam's the Van Dam, uh, Steven Seagal. Those are they're all real deal guys. That like as far as with I mean, obviously the movies fucking I don't know, Van Dam didn't do a Seagal? spinning yeah. a spinning three sixty. <laughs> no, dude, Seagal's a badass. Uh, have you seen some of those videos of him like doing his aikido and? Like everybody's just falling. I know somebody listening right now. Who, oh, who, who, shit, like they, I know his martial art that he does is supposed to be kind of a, uh, I have a, a tough joke. Time. I was a huge yeah. fan of his too, but yeah. I have a tough. Time. Do you remember when? Do you remember I when? Know, um, I don't know about him. What? Uh, God, why can I not think of his name? Who, uh, Steven Seagal and him trained a little bit. Who's a UFC fighter? Oh, was champion. That, uh, Anderson Silva. 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 Yeah. He taught him the front kick, and that front kick fucking knocked out quite a few people, bro. Yeah, that was yeah. pretty. Randy Couture, actually. Yeah, yeah. dude. So he's the really. Yeah. He probably whooped one of our asses. Let's put that. Yeah. Yeah, he's got enough training. He knows more than me. Well, yeah. here's the deal with that kind of flexibility. When you're an acrobat and you're training with that kind of flex, so so there's contortionists and then there's like acrobats that actually have to support themselves yeah. with their flexibility, with tension. Right. So then you're you're strong. You're definitely strong right. in those positions, definitely. But yeah, there's that scene in the movie where where John Clavin M's running kind of slow, and then the old coach is like, "Here, put this on your leg," and it's like just a piece of meat. And he straps <laughs> around his leg, and he's like, "What?" He's, he looks. He's looking at it like, "What are you doing?" He's like. It'll make you run faster, like it's some like ancient like Thai wisdom or whatever. Out comes the dogs. Then he lets the dog loose to chase him. <laughs> Good times. Oh yeah. So did you guys hear Walmart now is going? Uh, they're they're now testing out no uh, checkout. They're gonna have checkout. Yeah, they're going to have checkout they are testing out no checkouts and no like like that Amazon. Dude. Oh, they are. Testing. They're making moves. Man. Let the wars begin. Oh yeah. I mean they've they've invested a lot of money into the online presence. They're actually redoing their whole website, I believe. Yeah. On top of that, because yeah. it's like. Yeah, they're the only ones that are actually like still competing with Amazon. Bro, you go in. Well, they're the only they're the, they're the only ones that could even battle them financially. Like it's right. you know when you get one of the things I've definitely learned as we get keep growing even ourselves and the more you get around these bigger CEOs and bigger companies, it's like it's literally a race to who can spend the most money. It's like who has enough capital that they can go throw millions of dollars at a pro- like a project like that for Walmart has to be a fucking hundred million dollar mm-hmm. project yep. to even do that. Like, oh, it's a massive, massive steering project, man. Like that's just it. If you've everything. done business for so long and you've become so big, and Walmart's the largest employer in America, it's a massive, massive, massive. Do you know if it was? You know, company. Do you know if it was owned by one person, it would be the richest person in the world? Yeah. It's because they yeah. divided over All the entire family. family. Yeah. If you combine all their net worth off of what they make off of Walmart they would shit on yeah. everybody it's uh, they've they, they've done some and there's some stuff business wise that people don't like but let's face it they have mastered the art of efficiency mm-hmm. um, in many many different ways so it's going to be like the old versus the new it'll be interesting because because Walmart's a monster Mm-hmm. So it'll be an interesting battle. See what happens. My bet's still on it's Amazon. It's a war. Yeah. You think I, so? Yeah. I st- I just I think because they're in so many other spaces too, it just gives them other leverage and opportunity because you see what they're doing with robotics too. You see what where he's yeah. going. That there's. I think he's still two three steps ahead. I think Walmart. Dude, I forgot he owns the Washington Post and like has read basically has redone the way that we look at news. Right. You know, like he's got algorithms and everything already that everybody's biting yeah, off dude. of. At, at this point, to me, I, when I see something like that with like a Walmart, um, it's more like a desperate move to stay alive. That's what it's, it is. The inevitable is happening. The inevitable is happening. Amazon's going to go- gobble us up. Yeah. We could spend Toys R Us bit the dust. Now right. they're just like, oh shit, we, we better really get serious. Right. So it's like, I think this is the last straw to try and hang on for as long as you can. But if, you, if, you're, if you're Walmart execs, you've got to be thinking in the back of your head, like we had a great run. 
We had a great run. We did all these great things. Sure, we're making tons of money still right now, but you have to see what's coming. You have to know that the future is upon it. Dude, really soon here, I don't think we're going to... Dude, grocery stores, lines, shopping and lines and mall shit is going to yeah. die, dude. Well, so what they're... People what, are, it's not going to be like... It's going to well, be showrooms everywhere. Well, because what they're doing is Eliminate they haven't... Lines. It's like Amazon. They have an app. You go in, you scan what you want, Mm -hmm. um, and then you walk out with it, and so you're going to be able to go to these stores, and there won't there won't be there'll be like one employee in there, right? Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's but, awesome. But even then, it's going to be like what you just did the other day, which was you go in there and you literally Amazon it, and then you know it's going to be at your house tomorrow, and yeah. you're like, I'm going to carry it in my car. You know? Gonna, well, yeah. think about it this way: yeah, they might, if they organize it right, if they organize it the right way, an Amazon store may actually be able to provide you cheaper than delivery because now there is no delivery. If you're willing to drive to the store and just grab it yourself, you may actually, it may start to flip again where you actually start to save money for certain products. I could see how that may, it's it's hard to, it's well, hard there's, to predict. There's certain things like with a grocery store. I know there's people that are going to want to like look at their fruits and vegetables and they want, they have the, they have their like this. Well, bro, you can order now from uh, Whole Foods now. You can order and they'll deliver it to your house. Yeah. I think Within a few hours. So they so Safeway has been doing like <laughs> delivery service for a long. I actually used to use it damn near ten years ago, um, and the only knock that I had on it. So it you know sometimes it would show up and they didn't have one or two things that you would put on your list, and so that you they would you just wouldn't get it. You know they would say oh we were out of stock on that, or you know you would get a head of lettuce and you're like oh I wouldn't have picked this head of lettuce. Mm -hmm. You know like so those are the drawbacks that will still keep people coming into just like somebody who buys a pair of sneakers you know some people for sure want to go in and try them on like if i'm going to sure. spend 100 some dollars on a pair of sneakers i want to at least put them on my feet see what they feel like someone like me who owns already air maxes Roche, all these shoes it's like i already know what they feel like i already know the sizing on them like i can i'll just order them online there's no reason for me to go into a store. i don't even try, when i go to shoe stores to this like to this day i don't try them on i like mm -hmm. i need a 12 in that i know i know the the shoe brand and i know the sizing and how they fit and it's like i just want to know if you have it if you well, have it i got it i forgot what what hurricane it was there was like a natural disaster where the the coast guard couldn't get water to people in time and so walmart Got it there in time mm. because Walmart had. They're so that efficient was the, with their that shipping. was the uh, New Orleans one. Was it? Yeah, I believe okay. it was that one. I believe okay. it was that one. I'm not 100 percent sure on that, okay. but I think it was that. Yeah, because they figured out efficiency like on a whole. That new was level. Uh, Hurricane Katrina, I think. You think it was the big one? Yeah, yeah. I, th yeah. I think it was. It I might have been. I think I don't could've know. Though. I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but I remember. I remember that I being a big deal. Florida. And a lot, and there was a, you know I don't remember who was what was going on in office at that time and how much he, he took for You know, that. it's funny. We had this, con I just had this conversation uh, yesterday where, so we were watching this episode of uh, Electric Dreams, that show I told you guys about on Amazon. All right. By the way, all the episodes aren't, they're not all excellent. Some are not as good as others. Ah, see, that's like Black Mirror. Yeah, but the first one, the first episode yeah. was fire. Anyway, there was an episode where there were these three guys working in this, it was way in the future and it's this, this tech plant and the, the plant is making like, you know, uh, like parts for machines or whatever, and there and there's just three of them working in this massive in this massive uh, you know plant, and they're just doing like this mundane shit. And at the and then there's a part in the show where they're having a conversation. And one of the guys like, well, he's like, why are we here? Like, why are we even doing this work? They don't need us to do this. And the other guy's like, well, according to law, they need to have some humans here, and the unions fought for it. So be grateful. And we were laughing because I thought about that because that's the that's totally true. I could totally see how people would say, no, you 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 need to employ. A certain amount of people because we can't go fully automated because we need to have jobs or whatever. Yeah. And I was thinking about this and it's like, you know, it, it, it only costs, uh, it only costs mankind or humanity. It costs us wealth. It costs us innovation. It costs us so many different things by reducing efficiency just to try to, you know, to try to take care of other people or whatever, because it looks like it's a good thing. Like if we can be more efficient, we always should always, if right. it's more efficient, always go more efficient because that's what creates wealth and that's what makes things more available to more people. And so when you look at this kind of stuff, because I, 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 you know, your, your knee jerk reaction when you hear Walmart and, you know, these other grocers who are eliminating all these positions where it's going to be automated is like you immediately think of like, oh, all these poor people who lose, you know, who lose jobs. But the reality is the, the dramatic increase in efficiency creates more wealth for, for everybody. That's just how economies grow. So initially it looks bad, but really it's it's not. It's just you're just making things more efficient. It would be no different than eliminating all the telling it, you know, making it illegal to to own a tractor and say no, everybody should use shovels because now we're going to employ five times as many people 
because a tractor will do the job of five people. You know, this that is, would be terrible. This is yeah. such a touchy subject and topic too, because man, I have I have my best friend who I grew up like this go all the way back to elementary school. And in, in our old town that we grew up in, we grew up in a very small town up by Don Pedro Lake. And I mean, the high school had like 100 students in it when I was a kid in there. It's like that small, right? And right now they're going through this battle where there's there's only like one major market, like grocery. It's not even like a real grocery store. It's more like a gas station, grocery store, liquor store, everything all combined. And then there's like a little hardware store and there's all these little like mom and pop brands that are shops that have been running their business off the small community there for probably the last 50 years plus or whatever. And in comes this general store. And I don't know if you guys have seen general, uh, general, mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah, general store, dollar general, excuse me, dollar right. general mm -hmm. uh, okay. store, which is basically like those dollar stores. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, it's a huge company that's like nationwide. And they, this is what they specialize in is going into these small towns like right. this. Right, and it feels a little predatory oh, because it's, it's it's going into these like the town meeting towns over it. Are, it's yeah. fucking my buddy's parent. Lower like, and, income. And left. I, I have a really hard time like with where I stand on it because I I see both sides. Right, yeah. it's, I got somebody close to me who it directly affects their income because they own they own property of the store, one of the stores that it will directly compete with. That's going to now fuck them and having a lease there. So it's like so of course they're fighting to keep yeah. it out. But then I have my other free market mind that goes. Well, I mean, shit, if they're going to come they're in gonna and employ people, if they right? Get right, they're going to employ people. They're going to provide more stuff for a better rate. It's like, well, it's, the, hard, it's hard for me to get, get behind that. Here's the bottom line. Yeah. If, if they don't like it, this is funny. It makes me laugh when they have these town meetings. It's like, really? You, you can fucking make sure they don't succeed. Just don't buy shit there. Like it's all, it is within your power. The, the, the real problem is people don't like the reflection that the market provides. So what, what I mean by that is they see a Walmart move in or they see something else move in and then all these other small stores shut down because they're cheaper, more efficient and, and they provide better or, you know, or more variety or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they don't like the way that looks. So they want to ban it. Instead, just don't shop there. You know what I mean? Put your money where your mouth is. The truth is if that general store moves in and the town decides not to shop there, then guess who goes out of business? The yeah. general store does. Yeah, but we know it's going to happen, right? We know it. Why? Right. Why? Cause because it's it's, it's, that's it. Yeah. Because it's better. So That's why I say I have a really, it's a really tough conversation for me to have because, again, I've yeah. got family and friends on that side that it's directly affecting, but then I also have the other side of me that, you know, if if I've always if they weren't in the mix, I would one hundred percent be like, oh my god, I'm totally for the store coming in there. It's better, it's cheaper. Why would as a consumer, that's a no brainer. But you know, when it's somebody who's close to you, you actually have to start to think that way. Like, oh shit, dude, my boys had that property business, for yeah. thirty. Well, 40. that's why it's tough to always have the same thing and never evolve. And you know, like some of these stores that I mean, you love because it's kind of quaint and it's like something that has been there always, but at the same time never changed and so it's like inevitably something's going to come through and and that's just how it goes right you know, that's, what's that, that that short read who moved my cheese or whatever that's oh, a good I short read that right one. there that, that's yeah. a good one for along those you know it's just I, it is it's true justin it's i think that it's so important we talk about personal growth all the time and that obviously leads into business too like you can't just not the be same thing. you've got to be constantly growing you got to be constantly evolving you got to be thinking about those things you're you're either growing or dying always people just don't That's think it. about that it's like you're yeah. Yeah. there's no such thing as like I'm cruising along or business and you want to protect people cuz dude nobody likes to be an asshole you know and come through and just gobble these like businesses up no. but it's just like that's just how things go dude if 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 i'm a, if i'm a business owner and another business comes in and now if they were lying or they were you know stealing or doing something like that's different but if they were just competing with me um and i'm getting my ass kicked like i'm not gonna get mad at the business i'm gonna if i need to get mad at anybody i'll look at my customers be like you fucking unloyal sons of bitches Man. why would you guys should keep coming here or I'd look at myself, which is probably that's, that's the better that's thing to the do. Better thing to and do, and be like, okay, what can I do yeah. to compete better? What because unique service can I provide that's, that's different? Or yeah, or, or like you know, if I need to be competitive, what does that look like? Dude, you know, all that me, stuff. Let me let me tell you this right now: the the vast majority of jobs that existed 150 years ago don't exist today. Yeah, actually, I, I don't know. It'd be hard to find one that currently exists that that you know that existed back then. So that's just the reality, just the way it fucking works. Right. So to yes, we can look at the immediate and say, oh, these people are losing their jobs, but why are they losing their jobs? Because things are becoming more efficient, p things are becoming better, and consumers are choosing those things, which is 
better for most. God, for you everybody. just said something right now that you know. There's in the last hundred years, you think there's not very many jobs that exist. In very America. few. Well, you know what I'm thinking. Of. You know which ones you know, exist? I, the government ones, of course. I that's what the just went, yeah. that you said that I went the wait, DMV. Son, son of a bitch. Firefighters, yeah. cops, teachers. I mean, there's a lot of positions that are still exactly the same in a sense. Obviously, they've all evolved a little yeah. bit and changed, but I mean, for the most part, those have stayed very, very similar. They're protected. Far- mm-hmm. Right. Isn't They're that protected. Crazy? Isn't look that- at, look at. Wait, look. you know what that tells me? That tells me like, what if that, if it wasn't protected, would we, have we, would we and how we would. Oh, we everything would look different. Come evolve. on now. What yeah, do you everything think? would look different. Do you, let me ask you this. The do market you, changes so fast. Do you really think that if, if it wasn't this crazy, super hyper-regulated market for education, that uh, you would go to a, a, a university and spend fifty thousand dollars for an education, and then on top of it, spend a hundred, two hundred, three hundred dollars for a book, a paper book. I know. Today, that's yeah. how much kids are spending right now. You that's go to college silly. right now. You go take a course, and you and then you take a psychology course or a medical whatever, and they say here's the book you have to buy, and then you have to go buy this book, and it's a hundred and fifty. Where else in America does a book? Cost one hundred and fifty dollars <laughs> when you could stream or download that shit for probably twenty five cents or less, right? So yeah. yeah, but is that what everyone's doing then? Like, I, I mean, I'm not in school right now. I don't have anybody close to me that's in like college. Like, if that was the case, I'm in college. It's already changing. I was gonna say you would if if I was in college, I would be a kid who would be like, well, fuck this, I'm not buying the. I'll just put it on my iPad. I'll buy, I'll stream it or find it downloaded or whatever. I'm sure there's, and you know too the way everyone pirates shit now. There's got to be a the Napster of school books. I'm saying oh, yeah. the Napster of like college school books has got to go be way, out there somewhere. They, they go way out of their way to try to protect the books by changing them Dude, every year. I remember but. just being when I was at San Jose State, like they had uh, just started like Amazon and they had just started um, like reselling these books. And so you could find used books for like not even a fraction of what they costed in, in the regular like student store. And I was like, thank God. Like, cause it was like you said, it was like 500 bucks for like a textbook. You're like, what the <laughs> fuck? Like, are you serious? And so yeah. you'd find it for like 20 bucks and you just, man, I don't care if it's got highlighters and fucking no, like, med- medicine dicks drawn in it. I don't care. Medicine. You're, you're, you're so our, the way we do our healthcare, you extremely, the guy extremely right, regulated. Me. The way yeah. then I resell it. Let's that, be honest. You buy your own book back. Uh, education, fifteen dollars. Education, healthcare, the 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 housing market, like all the things that are the most regulated. No, I know you, when up. you said it, you just kind of gra- you glazed right over it, and I was like, wait a second, you are kind of right, but no, you're wrong. There's a lot of company car or business or jobs that still exist and that are almost exactly the same. But before I said something, I was like. All those are almost all these protected, protected, yeah, protected dude. All well, look at government look, based. God, what does well, that tell think you, about dude? it this way: How long did taxi did taxi cabs were they the same? The whole system. How long was it the same for? Decades. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For decades, it was the same shit. You go in, you go. You know how long it was before taxi cabs took freaking credit card. Do you know why they take credit card now? Because they because of Uber and all these other companies. It wasn't because yeah. taxi cab companies thought it was a great idea. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. How long was that was that an issue where you it's the same shit. It was the same shit forever because they had these crazy regulations and laws that literally made it a monopoly. So in order for you to have a tax, you got to buy this medallion that costs fifty thousand dollars in New York and so there's a limited amount because they passed law saying they can only sell so many to guarantee that they're always gonna have work and mm-hmm. there's no competition and that's why it's so hard to get a cab and this, that, and the other. And then you know Uber came out because Uber exists in an, in an unregulated space uh, because without tech, they would have never been able to, to do what they it's did. It's so beautiful too because what you see, look at how many people, like look at how many people are using Uber now. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't take taxis. Any- overnight. I didn't take taxis anywhere, but I do take Ubers now everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. You oh. know what I'm saying? I never took a taxi. It's so efficient. Yep. Yeah. It overnight. Is. It ha- almost overnight. Literally, think about it this way. Decades, you had just taxis for decades. Uber comes in and within like what? I don't know, five years, destroys the whole market in a very mm-hmm. short period of time. Yeah. So imagine if they if they lifted regulations on other things like like you know, like in medicine. Like it, honestly, do I need to have do I do I need to have a prescription from a doctor to get birth control? Let's use that as an example. Why do I need to go to a doctor to get birth control prescription? A pharmacist could probably uh, give that to me. me. I need to look at your vagina. Yeah, but a pharmacist could probably give that to me. Do you know one of, the, one of the companies that Taylor's talking to right now is on the front end of that with on the the men's like uh, erection pills and stuff, right? Mm. So that's what they're they're trying to bypass this whole why you got to go in to go see a doctor to get prescribed all that shit. It's like you've got a, if you got a boner issue, you should be able to get these pills. Everyone, we know we, <laughs> we don't they, need to tell the whole world, right? Yeah. No, yeah. that's exactly that's exactly what they're trying to do. It's, <laughs> it's supposed to. 
yeah. it's supposed to be yeah. like that. So it's a company that leave me and my limp dick alone. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Doug, bring on the bird. Hey, Adam, before we get going here, a few listeners have been asking about some of your recipes for Organifi. Oh. I, have no, I, I have no idea how to find those. So, and by the way, too, I'm going to get back to that just to give everyone a heads up. I've been getting back in the swing of my training and everything. And the first process for me was just getting back to lifting and shit like that. And and I this week was the first week I prepped food. And so I'll also be making a lot more of my Organifi recipes like I was before and sharing my story. So that being said, if you, want, if you don't want to wait for when I'm going to be posting stuff, The two places that I get it from, uh, Doug, is if you go to the website, it's kind of weird how you have to find these. I don't know why, and maybe I'm wrong and there's other places, but when I go to the website, you go down, I'll scroll all the way down the bottom of the website, and there's an area that shows where the blogs are, and you click the blog tab, and then you just kind of like slide through the blogs, and there's a lot of different blogs written on like different shakes and pancakes and muffins and uh, protein balls and ice cream stuff and popsicles, sweet potato. I mean, there's a ton of different recipes on there and then they actually put a lot on their their instagram so if you're not following the organifi instagram uh they post some and a lot of the recipes are are good man Mm -hmm. the the products are good they mix well with food um i I do it a lot i just haven't been lately and i'm tell you guys right now i'll get back into it so that's where i get them all this quaz brought to you by organifi for those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use the coupon code MindPump for 20% off at checkout. All right, our first question is from Muscle Mouse. Yeah. Is there a difference in meal timing for men and women and how it affects body composition? Meal timing. This keeps coming up. You know, I I think we need to address it just because it keeps coming up because it's something that I know we've talked about, which, by the way, reminds me, this is a good time to to plug this while I'm thinking about it. We have a free app on iTunes. So if you guys download on iTunes, you go there and look for Mind Pump. Uh, You can download the app for free. And this is perfect for some of this. If you actually put meal timing in, you would actually hear uh, it'll it'll populate all the episodes where we've discussed topics like this. So mm-hmm. I always encourage people to, if you follow us, you listen to the show, download the app. You know, definitely search for a question that you might have first, and then if you can't find it, then absolutely yeah. leave it up here. But so we, we should just it yeah, we should just answer this completely different this time. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. matters a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Everything, <laughs> everything, now, base it, everything around this. You know, uh, meal timing. It matters somewhat, but not nearly as much as uh, as they'll make you believe. I remember, okay, so meal timing, this whole like you have to eat at these particular intervals or make sure you eat right after you work out or you have to eat, don't eat before bed, like all these different types of things were typically put out uh, to sell, sell you products. more products, you know? So mm. so let me let me break that down for you. If I... If I can sell you on the fact that you need to have food right after your workout, because right after your workout, you know, there's this window, this anabolic window where all, most of the food that you eat is going to go to repair and rebuild muscles, and it's great for fat loss and all these different things. And chewing food takes too long. Yeah. And I say <laughs> that, and I, and I sell you that idea. The odds that you'll that that meal will be a shake or a bar are quite high because post workout is an inconvenient time to eat for a lot of people. Yeah, no you shit. Know, you know, you got to take. You, you, what are you going to do? You going to open up your Tupperware? Yeah, you're not going to bring your room? chicken breast. Exactly, which some bodybuilder guys do, which is funny. Yeah, uh-huh. which they, which they tend to do. Um, and or if I sell you the idea that you need to eat small meals throughout the day because, you know, and the way we used to sell it was, and I say we because I did the same thing. This is what I thought to be true. If we say Uh, You know, if you go too long without meals, your body goes into starvation mode and then it starts to store body fat. And so if you feed your body every few hours or every two hours, your body knows it's going to have food coming again. It gets used to it and it gets and it more readily burns calories because of this, you know, consistent flux of uh, of food. And that's what we used to say to people. And that's also bullshit. Now, Now, why would they sell that? Well, if I can sell you that you need to eat five or six meals a day the odds that one to three of those meals are going bars to be or shakes. bars or shakes is quite high yeah. because the average person is not a super dedicated bodybuilder willing to carry around, around you know, Tupperware containers of food. Most people will eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or maybe lunch and dinner, and then they'll just say, well, cool. I heard I'm supposed to eat small meals throughout the day, so I'm just going to buy 
you know, these bars and walk and have them with me. And I know that my snack is going to be this protein bar. My next meal is going to be a real meal. And the next meal is going to be a shake. And so these myths just, they just permeated the fitness industry in, a, in such a way that they became common knowledge to the point where here's the deal. This is the truth now. And I know it's true for you guys too, because we've talked about this. I was a trainer professionally or in fitness professionally for, for 20 years it took me 10 years to figure out that the eating small meals and eating post-workout and all the important, how important they were, that it was largely bullshit. It took me 10 years to figure that out because it was from every you know, magazine, from every information outlet, from every fitness organization, including the gym I worked for or the certifications I took or the, you know, where, everything I read said the same thing. So you assume that it's true. If you read it from everyone, it's it becomes common knowledge and it's totally true. Well, about 10 years into my career, I read this book called The Warrior Diet, which talks about fasting. And then I was on the forums uh, on bodybuilding.com and I read all these athletes who were like, oh man, I feel, I feel great. I haven't lost any muscle. I haven't gained any body fat. It's way more convenient. Now, instead of eating six meals, I just eat two or I just eat three or some people say I just eat one. And that prompted me to actually look into the science behind meal timing to see does eating six meals a day burn more body fat and build more muscle than say eating two or three times a day and the science says it does no nothing it, nothing there is no difference right now this is general and what i mean by general is generally speaking it does nothing does that mean on an individual basis that eating small meals is not going to benefit you? No. It might actually benefit you because that's that may be the way you prefer to eat. Or you may be a big bodybuilder who's consuming 5,000 calories a day, in which case that's going to be tough to do in two or three meals. It's almost impossible. Yeah, yeah. So Think about that. Two, that's 2,500 calories, uh, especially if you're trying to eat healthy. That's right. Right. Yeah. 20, try, try and eat 2,500 calories. Try and eat 2,000 calories healthy in one sitting. I mean- Pushing over fifteen hundred. I mean, unless you're having a big, huge ribeye steak and something well, else. Even then, you're so satiated. Uh, like getting through that's going to be yeah. brutal. And, and this is I just I just talked to someone the other day about a similar topic as this, and they were asking about su supplements and meal timing, and they're like, you know, did you did you do that? And I'm like, yeah, you know, when I when I'm competing, there, I'm using some supplements, and I am and I am meal timing, but it's on the very bottom of my list as far as the order of things that I start to take over. Like right now, absolutely, I'm not meal, meal timing or using any supplements. Why would I do that when there's so many other things I need to fix yeah. within my routine, my nutritional routine, my exercise routine? There's so many other big rocks I need to pick up first before I start trying to like make sure I get a meal in two hours before my lift and then within an hour window after I lift. Mm -hmm. Like that shit is so at the bottom of the list I think that's the main point that we always try to make. Sure, you can come find some study that shows me that you have a fraction of a percent of a more, you know, a higher rate of muscle that can be potentially built if you, you know, in, intake X amount at this time. It's like, dude, the, the, the amount that makes a difference is so you know, splitting hairs of a difference. So it's not that it doesn't matter at all. So fuck it out the window. It means that Look first. Look at all the other things that you you need to dial in, and and then on, then you can start to visit. If you got everything else dialed in, so this is where I understand when I look at like competitors. Competitors are measuring and weighing their food. Like, there's one for you right there. If you're an average person who's trying to lose weight or build muscle, and you're not weighing and measuring your food and tracking, are you kidding me? Like that's way more important than trying to time a meal way more important like so start there and like start paying attention to what you're consuming first before you start to add in a supplement or worry about getting a meal too late too early or right before or right after a workout but i mean hey if you've got all that stuff lined up you're dialed in you're measuring your weighing you're tracking you've seen all this stuff your workouts are great. You're phasing your workouts. You're progressing. You're, you're progressing. You're increasing volume. You're doing all these other things that are so much more important as far as your results. And you're like, hey, you know what? Like, I want to see what would happen if I actually ate my meal two hours before my workout. Or you know what? I'm going to try and go fast. Like, I encourage that. Fuck with your meal timing. Mm -hmm. Play with it. You know, I used to tell clients like, okay, if you are a breakfast skipper and you tend to eat meals super late at eight or nine o'clock, I said, hey, I got an idea for us. Let's do this. 
let's stop eating meals after six o'clock for you for a while and see how, how you feel and what happens. Guess what normally happens to that person? They're starving at that six. They feel like they're dying at six or seven and they live. And then the next day they end up being hungry at six o'clock in the morning. And so they actually eat a breakfast and it's different. Their body has to change. There's something going on that they're not used to. So I encourage the, the people to play with their meal timing and see like how their body responds. You know, someone who might eat a meal two hours before a workout might feel a little lethargic from it. Mm-hmm. They might not like it. Somebody, But then somebody else may feel incredible performance and an incredible pump because they had a meal to it. Somebody else, I know, Sal, you talk a lot about how many, you love fat, being fasted more. Mm-hmm. Like, so much more. Yeah, before, right. Yeah. Some people love to be fasted way, way more. So that's, that's it. Well, it's so interesting to me that we look at it like, I found this thing that works for me. You know, and like it's it's this like rigid plan that has, you know, you've you've done all the research, you've gone through all these different types of diets, and now I found one that stuck. Well, it's not always going to stick, right? <laughs> it's like you really have to be flexible, and you have to always kind of be ahead of this. And the, it, well, it's interesting. Meal timing is one of those things. The top I thing to consult, the number one thing you need to check and consult if you're determining your, uh, you know, meals, uh, how many meals you need to have a day, is just which one do you like better. That's it. That's pretty much it. Because one thing that we don't talk about enough when it comes to nutrition is the psychological component, which arguably is the most important component with, with all nutrition. If we had to list all the important things with your diet, it's that's the top one is your the, the that psychological component. Because the best diet in the world that you hate isn't going to be as good for you as one that's not as good that you can yeah. stick to and you're consistent with. So if you find that eating six meals a day is your jam and you just fucking love it. Well, guess what you should probably do? Eat six meals a day. If you find that, you know, skipping meals and having less meals is, makes you feel better and it's better, you know, portion control, you don't eat as much, then go for that. There's There are very... Now, of course, if you go extreme, right? If, if you're going, you know, one meal every other day or something like that or, or 15 meals a day, well, now, of course, there's there's better and worse. Mm. But generally speaking, it's all it's all based on which one you enjoy doing more. Now, there are some cases where I may tell someone to eat more meals and some cases where I tell people to eat less meals. The people who, who probably should eat more consistently throughout the day are like these people who have like metabolic adaptation where, you know, or metabolic damage or HPA axis dysfunction. We probably want to feed them a little bit more frequently because they may have issues with cortisol. Uh, we may want to kind of suppress that a little bit and put them more in that parasympathetic state, which meals tend to do. So if somebody comes to me and I'm, and I'm talking to them and I figure, you know, oh, wow, you've got metabolic damage or HPA axis dysfunction, then I'm probably not going to have them do a lot of fasting because that might not be that might be counterproductive. I may have them eat a little bit more frequently, but otherwise it's it's so up to you. I was so different than all my other peers when I was competing with this. Like they all are so adamant about getting everything in their shake right after post workout. Like this is how I did it. Like so, if when I was you know post or pre getting into a show, right? So before I'm even to prepping. So I believe that some of the hardest work is done leading up to show prep time. And show prep time would be anywhere between six to 12 weeks for the average competitor. It's the time leading up to that where I think the real work is done, which is building up a roaring metabolism. So when I'm uh, increasing my caloric intake and I'm, you know, quote unquote bulking, uh, I'm eating 5,000 plus calories a day. So I'm eating six meals a day pretty much. So every two to three hours I'm consuming something. And then when I go, when I step into prep time, I've got this physique where I'm probably hanging around 9% body fat or so, eating 5,000 calories a day, six meals a day, and now it's time to get shredded for showtime to get on stage. And the first thing that I do is just eliminate a meal somewhere. And I like to play with that. Which is the opposite of what? Right. I just eliminate a meal. and It might be a pre-work. It might be a meal before my workout. It might be a meal after. It might be the last meal of the day. It might be the first meal of the day. And I like to do that where, so let's just say the, like, then we'll just walk you through like what it's six to seven weeks leading up to a show looks like where I reduce calories. I'm going to cut 500 to a thousand calories out of the, out of the diet the first week. Okay. 500 to a thousand calories come out. I'm going to distribute that differently. Sometimes I'll spread it out, out across the meals. Sometimes it'll be an entire meal, like I'm saying. And then I'm going to pay attention like how I perform. Well, did I have a great workout when I did that? Did I sleep really well? Did I get up really well? Did I have energy throughout the day? Was I had sustained injury? Energy? I'm paying attention to where I pay, what I pick and pull from and how it affects my body. And I think that everyone's going to be uniquely different. I think if you are have a habit of eating in a certain pattern all the time, one of the best things that you could do for yourself is to shake that up. 
I mean, why do we? Why would we treat the way we consume food nutritionally when we talk? All we, we talk about adaptation all the time. I mean, MAP stands for that, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just talking about the the muscular system. But what what about your digestive system? What about your what about that? Why wouldn't our bodies get adapted and used to that? Wouldn't it be advantageous to do different things and challenge it in different ways? Like, and, and what better way to shake up your how you eat than to go without food? For a little while, right? I mean, because most people never done that. You know what I mean? Most, especially people who eat small meals throughout the day. You have somebody who eats six meals on a consistent basis, and you tell them, "Okay, today we're going to take all your calories." And we're oh, I'm the only co- meals. only <laughs> coach I know that had bikini competitors, men's physique, and bodybuilders fasting in their routine, mm-hmm. like during prep. That was just like, and I remember every time I loved doing it because every time I get that question about, "What? I'm going to lose all this muscle? Are you kidding? I don't want to do that." Like so many would fight back. I'm like, no, just watch. We'll be, we'll be okay. Now, <laughs> you know, for health now, from a health, all things being equal, from a health perspective, uh, it's less inflammatory to eat less meals. Okay, eating it does require the digestive system to work. It it, it does require you know, things to be moving and in the context of inflammation, that might not necessarily be a good idea to eat a lot of frequent meals. So like if you have gut issues, you you might be better off not eating lots of small meals. So that you may find that your digestion feels better when you eat more like, you know, two or three meals. But again, the studies have been done on this pretty consistently and they've shown no difference uh, whatsoever. And maybe, may even be counterproductive to have too many small meals throughout the day. It may cause a little bit of inflammation May not be great for you, especially if you have uh, if you have gut issues. But otherwise, it's it's totally. I mean, it's it's just totally up to you. And and I've found for me personally, most days I eat two times a day, maybe three times a day, most days. And then I and then there's days, of course, that I fast and I don't eat at all. Um, and everybody I've worked with so far seems to kind of be in that realm of 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 two to three. I have worked with people who say they just love eating small meals throughout the day, and that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. If that's your jam, go for it. Right. Next question is from Katie Gassman. If you aren't breaking up fascia with foam ro- rolling, what is actually going on? I, God, I remember when we learned. Yeah. We all learned that, right? When that well, was not breaking up fascia. Because fascia well, not is breaking up like fascia, plastic, but, but you should say bl- breaking up the adhesions, adhesions. That, were, yeah. right, that were on there. We but. were taught that foam rolling uh, broke up adhesions, that your fascia got stuck, and that if you were pressing on it, it would break up the adhesion and then it would allow it to kind of move better and then that would alleviate pain. Which a lot stuff. of that is just because that's where the science was at the time, right? I mean, we just didn't under, fully understand how that worked. Yeah, I mean, we, had, we had no idea. Right? Yeah, and we watched some on. video about spina kind of breaking down, like what that would actually look like if you were to, you know, stretch it all the way apart and then get in there and like rub down one of those adhesions all the way. This, this would be cool like, YouTube. Like ridiculous. Yeah. Now, not now, you know, to be honest, when I first learned how to foam roll, it was a game changer. Mm. A- absolute game changer for me. I-, I would foam roll before my workouts and it improved my mobility, it improved my flexibility, and pr- took away pain instantly. And it was a great tool that I used as a trainer. I remember, you know, as being a trainer, I'd get a, especially if I had a client who was a runner or a potential client who was a runner, I used to love showing them the foam roller because then I look like a wizard. Like they come in and be like, <laughs> I have all this knee pain because I run. I'd be like, all right, I'm going to do something yeah. with you for 15 Here, I'm gonna minutes. I'm going to add pain to your yeah. pain. And I'll take the pain away and then I'd have them foam roll and then get up and they'd squat and be like, oh my God, my knee doesn't hurt anymore. <laughs> yeah. So foam rolling temporarily definitely uh, can reduce pain, but it's not breaking up fashion. It's not breaking up adhesions. Here's what we think is going on with foam rolling. Well, first off, when you apply pressure, you do activate certain pain receptors in those areas to, and, and that act, that actually releases uh, anti-pain chemicals or pain-relieving chemicals. So that starts to happen a little bit. You're also, anytime you press on a muscle, stretch a muscle, squeeze a muscle, you know, anytime you do something to a muscle, you are, you're, the central nervous system is reacting and responding. So what I think that's happening when you're foam rolling is the central nervous system is firing a little bit differently afterwards, which may take away some pain. Um, and that can be beneficial if you know how to use a foam roller. And that was my way of doing it until I really discovered priming. Priming blows foam rolling away completely because priming not only yeah. does what the foam rolling does, but it does it in a more permanent way to where I'm actually changing recruitment patterns because I'm connecting to these new movements and stuff. And so once I learned how to prime, I stopped foam rolling before my workouts. Now I almost never foam roll 
pre-workout if i do foam roll it's post I, so you add that element to it, you also add blood flow and localizing you know more recovery that way with blood flow and movement uh being it's just so much more superior i found oh, like in God, my own so practice it's like it's crazy but you're right like foam rolling still has you know a benefit to it there's definitely ways to utilize foam rolling in order to um, sort of reprogram and, and repattern a way of, uh, you know, recruiting, um, you know, muscle. And so there, there is ways that we still even apply that in our programming. And a lot of times it tends to be more towards the end of the workout, which, uh, is, is something where I would do like first thing, like cold, I would have to do like foam rolling. That was like the way I would do it forever. Right. Right. Yeah. The, our intentions were different, you know, back yeah. then, you know, I, I thought it was necessary for us to do that, to get that same feeling. You know, the analogy I gave to someone is more like this. You know, you get these, 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 this tightness or these knots or this pain, like in your IT. And it's like, you know, what happens is, you know, it gets overused when we're whatever, it, whether you're squatting or lunging or whatever caused it to get really tight and do that. And then you get like this, we start to prioritize all these neurons over there and it's like, it's overactive and it's stimulating. It's like, it's, it's clenching and it's tight. Mm. And that foam roll kind of gives you that, sends that signal to like what Sal was describing of just relax for a second. And I think that's the relief that everybody feels that's happening is it is, it's more the CNS relief that you're actually feeling. And then, you know, I was like, it's kind of like if, and I know this is an extreme analogy, but you know, if you're, if your IT really hurt and you've, you're like, oh my God, it's driving, driving me nuts. And then I punched you in the fucking face as hard as I could. I promise you, your, your CNS would fucking prioritize. It would, <laughs> it would, it would, you wouldn't be thinking about the IT anymore. It would prioritize over to your face. Uh, <laughs> so what do you call that? Like that loop that perpetually gets worse. Positive feedback. Positive loop. feedback. So it's like you're interrupting that basically right. in a sense. That's like, what I, I just, so that's, and that again, that was an extreme analogy. Yeah. Of course, don't punch your friend the next time they say, have, or your client when they say they have a knot in their IT or whatever. But, you know, I think that's a, a majority of the relief that we get is that because it kind of hurts, you know, when you first put on there, it's like this, ah, this tensing and you're rubbing it out. And then you then when you get off of it, it that's what feels better. It's not the actual initial pain of the foam rolling that gives the relief. It's the actually when you get done with it and you stop rolling it that you go, oh, it's man. just it's just it's so foam rolling similar. It's not the same, but it's similar to like what deep tissue massage will do. So if you mm -hmm. have you have knots in your traps or your lats or your shoulders or wherever, and then a good massage therapist goes in there and really presses hard on them and pushes on them. And then you'll feel, sometimes you'll feel the relief happen instantly. Like they'll push real hard in a knot and then it feels like, wow, that knot went away. When you're applying pressure, it, it, you're, you're, the CNS is, you're basically sending a signal to the CNS that says, relax, relax this muscle. Now, if you push too hard to do the opposite, you can actually get something to, to tighten up. Like if I just punch you right. as hard as I can and your Everything's arm. Everything's going to brace. Yeah, but if I protect. press and I apply the right kind of pressure over time, the CNS starts to relax. But you could do this with stretching. Stretching does, does something like this as well. And through that relaxation, you can change recruitment patterns. But, but if, you, if you don't strengthen new recruitment patterns or you don't train new ones with resistance or with movement... It's temporary. So again, if you go to a massage therapist because you have knots in your traps and they press those knots out and then you leave and you feel better, but you don't, tr you, you don't change your recruitment pattern enough mm -hmm. to, to, to where it's permanent and you go back to moving how you were before, you're right back at the massage therapist the next week with the exact same pain. Now, I want to point out, though, that much of what we're talking about right now is based off of the current science and the information that we have. Therefore, this is the theories that we have because the fascia is something that is we know we don't know that no. much about there's a we know a lot about it but there's it's a lot all we, new science it is a lot of new science and a lot of that is in the last five to ten years we've learned so much about i mean shit they came out what was it last year or four talking about how we we can now show that memories are being stored in the fascia that's that's a yeah. that's a very hotly debated uh yeah. right theory. Right. right and again yeah. i'm not saying that that's true or false but and even what we're talking about right now the way we are explaining it is where I'm explaining this to you the best I can with the science and where we're at there. What I do know is that it's not what we thought it was five, 10 years ago. That's for damn sure. Well, it's definitely yeah. different than that. It's like anatomy trains and tensegrity and all these different like things that have come about that we're just understanding now how interconnected uh, all the tissue is, you right. know, and how they all communicate. Yeah. If, you know, one 
point of the body gets pressure, how that affects, you know, another point of your body. And it, it's, it's very complex. Uh, uh, you know, if you really start to kind of put a microscope under it, but. it's, it's a, so foam rolling is a tool, but it's not a cure tool. Um, unless it changes your recruitment pattern enough to, and it solves the problem. So if you find that you have really tight it bands and they hurt and then you foam roll and it feels better, you haven't solved the problem. You haven't solved the root cause of why that IT band is hurting in the first place. It may be a hip dysfunction. It may be coming from your ankles. It may be that your your gluteus medius isn't strong enough. So all other muscles are trying to support your your hips, and so the IT band is getting inflamed as a result. So you you know because I used to work with physical uh, excuse me with massage therapists who would do you know deep tissue work. But then what they would do is they would do the deep, deep tissue work, and then I would strengthen better recruitment patterns. And through the combination of us working together, we were able to solve a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. But if, it, if, if I didn't do that, then they would just be back at the massage therapist every right. week with the same exact problems. And that's how foam rolling was done. I used to have to foam roll before every workout, and I didn't even think twice about it and think, yeah. why do I have well, to do this every single now time? I'm going to do this forever. doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Now that I've been priming, I don't have to foam roll oh, at all. I dude. We, if you go I don't back, have any joint pain, you know, it's just like just being consistent is everything. If you go back far enough in in Mind Pump, you can hear when we were first creating Prime, and I remember that's when I decided to apply obviously the stuff that we were about to teach people. Like, okay, I'm going to give up foam rolling and see, you know, what if I were to just do mobility work and prime my prime my body and. I've never looked back. And I remember yeah. talking about it on the show, you guys would I'm like, dude, it's been six months. Oh, it's been eight months. Oh, it's been a year. Yeah. And I haven't I haven't foam rolled in fuck two two years now. Mm -hmm. Two years since I foam rolled. All mobility work. It I feel so much better. And it makes so much more sense to me too. If I'm gonna spend ten minutes on the floor, right. you know what I'm saying? I may as well be doing a lot of other things besides just you, foam. You may roll. as well be creating better recruitment patterns so that when you lift weights, you don't have to go back. <laughs> Keep yeah. coming back to the foam roller, right, right, because of the pain and burning more calories. I mean, it distributes on the force appropriately. You know, it's like we forget, how, like how why the mechanics are so important in each lift. It's so we can drive all these forces out through your body, so you're not like just going right into the joint. And it's like if I'm just going to keep doing the same thing that I've been doing, I'm just going to keep uh, feeling the same pains and going right back to the therapist to try and help me out. Right. Next question is from PT Cantrell 96. Do you subscribe to the theory that your body has a set point or is there a place your body becomes stagnant based on your daily habits? I've noticed since I dieted down, I tend to be more likely to binge. Could that be a result of my body feeling more comfortable at a higher body fat percentage? No, no, no. Here, no here's no, why no. I hate the word, this, this set point. You have a body weight set point. Um, yeah. And I hate this theory because is it true? To an extent, yeah. Like to an extent, there's a range that Adam is, can weigh. Like, can yeah, Adam I, weigh I'll, 50? I'll, I'll never look like Robert Oberst. Yeah, 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 I mean, yeah. it just you, I don't have the genetics, right? right, right? right. My, my body will never want to be that yeah. size. Yeah, you'll never weigh 50 pounds. You'll never weigh, you know, 350 pounds or 450 pounds. Right. Like, it's, it's true to an extent, but... To that extent, right there. But the 50 set to point, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of range yeah. in there. But the set point, the actual set point is so vast. It's literally the the heaviest you can get and the lightest you can get. And everything in between is determined by your by your lifestyle. Right. Yeah. Now, why is it that, that we find that we tend to... Our body weight tends to hover around a particular body weight? Well, uh, it's all psychological. One hundred percent. Not only that, it has more to do with You're very your, set in your ways. Yes, That's it. your patterns and your behavior. That's what I mean by psychological. Yeah. You, if yeah. you were people that people don't realize this, that kind of like kind of stay at the same weight for a really long time. Well, if you looked at an average caloric intake and their average movement over the course of that six months or whatever they stay, that's right. going to be about the same. Change your lifestyle, like yep. drastically change your lifestyle, and your body weight will change. That's just the bottom line. So, and it's if, very normal. It's totally a formula. It's works. very normal to feel this feeling. I mean, let me tell you, getting ready for a show, uh, yeah, my body does not want to only eat those calories the entire time. It wants to go up and eat more. You know that, but that that's just because you're eating less than your caloric maintenance, which again, is something that you can manipulate up or down, right? So you can change your caloric maintenance. Your caloric maintenance right now, let's just say hypothetically, is twenty five hundred calories. Well, if you're somebody who only eats 1,500 calories every day, well, guess what? You're going to feel hungry. You're going to see yourself lean out. And eventually what will happen is it will that will become its new 
caloric maintenance. Eventually, you will. If you stay at 1,500 for a year, that will now become homeostasis for you. And then now that where you go from there can make a difference. If all of a sudden you go back up to 2,000, you're going to gain weight. That's just mm-hmm. how it's going to work. You but- know what this is becoming is, and it's, it's classic, it's the, you know, if we can continue to give people reasons to not take responsibility, yeah. people will adopt it. And, I know. and the set point is one so of those here's things. Here's your diagnosis. Yeah. Oh, you know, I, oh, my sweet. body just I knew I was it wrong. wants to be, yeah. you know, 220 pounds at, you know, 20, you know, 4% body fat. That's my body's set point. That's just where it wants to be. No, that's just where you want to be. Psychologically speaking, your days all look the same. If you, yeah. if you look at your lifestyle, your physical rep- the, the physical representation of your body reflects uh, a large part of your lifestyle. Now, of course, like we said earlier, there's a certain there's a limit to how heavy you can get, and there's a limit to how light you can get. But man, that's a massive range. Like could I, like right now, I'm walking around. I'm probably one you know one ninety two, one ninety three. Could I get my body weight down to one sixty? I could. I could definitely do that if I drastically change my lifestyle. Could I get my body weight up to 230, 240? I could also do that, but it would be a drastic change in lifestyle. Uh, it doesn't mean that my set point is at, you know, where I'm at right now. That's just, this is where I like to be and it's where I want to be. And so when people lose weight and they diet down, they change their lifestyle. And then after they're down at that body weight, they find, hey, I want to go back to how I was before because I like doing that. Wasn't set point ba- based off of some diet gimmick like 10 plus years ago? Uh, they've been selling it forever. Wasn't yeah. that, wasn't that like yeah, I'm a, sure you could go online and do a calculator for that? Yeah, right I now. know there's yeah. a set point diet. I know that for sure. Here, but. Here's how set point actually works. If you live a particular way long enough, that becomes your psychological set point. It really does because you eat a particular way, you move a particular way, you buy clothes that fit you a particular way, you look a particular way, and so now you have this. This is who you are. This is your mm-hmm. image. To change that is incredibly difficult. You know, if, if you've been 30 pounds overweight for just five years, and most people have been for 10, 20 years, right? But if you've been 30 pounds overweight for five years, that means you've lived a you've lived a specific way to be 30 pounds overweight for five years. Now imagine doing anything consistently for five years and then having to drastically change it and then having to stay with that new which is why so many change. people feel like it's a set point is because they make some changes and they don't see a lot of results from it. they lose a few pounds that they feel so hungry or it they feels hard yeah it feels difficult well that it feels difficult for like just because what you said sells for five years this is like pretty much where you have lived you know this type of movement this type of exercise this type of calories and just you changing it somewhat is already going to shake things up. Like you're going to have to consistently change things up for the body to keep changing if you want to see a change. And think if you've been stuck the same way for five, 10, that's 15 right. years, it's going to take some time. And that's why when you approach things like this, if you're if you're approaching like, okay, I want to change my my body, I want to lose a lot of weight, or I want to gain muscle, or I just want to improve my health. Realize that you're what you're really asking yourself to do is to fundamentally change your life. It really is. It's your life. How you eat, how you sleep, how you train, the the choices you make, you have to change them on a fundamental level. And the easiest way to do that, or at least I should say the best way to do that, is to do it in a very gradual, challenging, yet realistic way. Because otherwise, it's just not going to happen. It won't work. I promise you. You change, if anybody tries to change their life drastically overnight, you. You may be a very disciplined person. You may be super dogmatic and hardcore about it, but that's going to be a very hard thing to do consistently. Like, you know, like I wake up at a particular time every day. I go to bed at a particular time every day. There are things that I like to eat, things I don't like to eat. There's ways I train. If tomorrow all of a sudden I flip that on its head and changed it completely, because I'm a disciplined person, I could probably do it for a while. But after a few months or whatever, it's going to be, it's very difficult. I'm going to want to go back to how I was before. So, Think of that when you're trying to make these changes. Challenge yourself enough to where you know it's a challenge, but also make it very realistic. And this is going to be different from person to person because what may be challenging but realistic for one person may be too unrealistic or too, and too challenging for another person or not challenging enough for someone else so they feel like it's not worth it. So, And it can be very, very small. I've talked, We talked about this on a previous podcast. Maybe the change that you make is... Okay, I'm going to you know eat one extra serving of vegetables every day, 
And I think that's going to be hard for me, but it's realistic. I think I can do it. I think if I, if I really try, I can do that. And then do that for a while. And when you find that that becomes a part of your life and that no longer is an issue, then you add on top of that. And that gradual process will change your psychological set point to the point where, where now your set point is very different. For years, for years, my body weight fluctuated between 190 and 220 or 230 pounds. I bulked and cut and bulked and cut and bulked and cut. And that became my natural. That became my set point. Around wintertime, I just ate a lot more. Around summertime, I dieted down. Now, now my body weight's kind of always around the 190. And that's my set point. But that's mainly because my lifestyle is the way it is. And I enjoy it. And it just stays that way. So, that's how you have to approach these things, but it's all it's all on you. Most of it's on you. Yeah, your genetics determine a certain asp- a certain percentage of it, but a large, large percentage of it is your lifestyle. And if you're ready to change your lifestyle or you want to change your lifestyle to change that set point, start with small pieces first and become consistent with those to the point where they become a part of your life before you move on to the next one. And then you'll find that you'll be able to walk around at a new set point. Next question is from Skamineski. What's the best way to address man boobs? Oh, that's a good topic. <laughs> it's a good topic, man. That's a lot. Oh, gotta love them man boobs. When you look at like uh, you know, the the top questions or concerns or things that we've this had. This one gets asked all the time. It does. From the guy like girls, it's the butt thing. Like butts and butts and abs thing. Like I we've got that probably thousands of times in my career. Like that's what you know, Adam, can we can I can I actually get a butt that's bigger and <laughs> do, am I gonna be stuck with this little flat butt forever? And and guys or men uh, it's the man boobs thing, you know, and there's a couple things. One, obviously, right out the gates, uh, if you have this more than likely, you're carrying a little bit excess body fat that's that, and you just tend to hold it in your chest and everybody is different here. This might be an area that your body naturally holds more body fat and so you get kind of this kind of sagging boob, man boob type of look. Also could be uh, related Very unfortunate. hormonally. Uh, you could have higher estrogen levels and maybe potentially low testosterone. I've had some of my, you know, men in their late 30s, 40s, and 50s before. I always tell them to go at least go get tested and see where your testosterone levels are. Because let's be honest, I could give you all the great exercise tips and diet tips to to do this, but if your uh, hormonal levels are fucked, it's going to be a real uphill battle to try and solve this. So my my first and foremost is always I advise. Uh, my guys that are, are struggling with this to f- go get your hormones checked, see where you are in the, the healthy range or not first. And then something that has worked, a, uh, I've had a lot of success with aside from just obviously lean. The obvious thing is lean out, right? Start leaning out. Um, but a lot of incline chest. Mm. So that, that, upper chest that has become a staple go-to uh, you know, exercise for me. And you know that people might be going like, wait a second, you guys talk about no such thing as spot reduction. It's not spot reduction. What I'm doing by doing that, you know, uh, by building his it's firming up. Well, yeah, it's firming his chest up and, he, and specifically his, his upper chest, the, the thought process or the theory for me when I first started doing this with clients was, you know, if I build, if, if you have kind of saggy boobs, you have kind of like this loose skin and, and fat that kind of makes it hang over. And if I can build that upper chest, it's going to pull that skin up and kind of set up a little bit higher. So, and it's worked incredible. This has been something that um, I would do. I would use like a program like our Maps Aesthetic, and I would put uh, my my body part focus. So in that program, we allow this flexibility so people can focus on specific body parts. So I would do Maps Aesthetic. I would do, um, and I would put chest as my my focus session, and I would put a lot of emphasis on um, upper upper chest, incline, incline chest presses, incline flies, barbell chest presses. Not to say to neglect the others, but that I would increase or add more volume uh, on the chest. Yeah, you, you got to get leaner. That's number one. Right, it's, right. It's usually body fat. It's usually just more body fat. You tend to store it around that part of your body, and you just you just got to get leaner. Um, in order to get rid of that. And how do you get leaner? Well, um, you know, reduce your caloric intake, improve your, increase your activity, speed up your metabolism in general, like lift weights. As far as the hormones are concerned, there are some natural supplements you can take if you think your, your, uh, your testosterone is aromatizing into estrogen at too high of levels. Now, you'll know if it's hormonal versus fat if it's really tender mm. to the touch. 
So if, 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 if it's just body fat, it's just fat. If it's te- if it's estrogen related, if your nipples are t- tender, yeah, if they're yeah. tender, or if you feel like a lump underneath you your flick nipple, your buddy's nipple, and you're like, uh. Ooh. yeah, then then it might be estrogen related. Which, by the way, body fat, excess body fat in men can raise estrogen levels as well. Estro- body fat is an estrogen sensitive uh, tissue in the body, so getting leaner and building more muscle tends to give men uh, a better you know hormone profile anyway. But there are some natural supplements. Um, Indol 3 carbonyl is one, or the more potent version is DIM, and the chemical name is D, uh, D-indol E, D-indol methane, I think I'm pronouncing it right, which is a, it's something you can find in cruciferous, cruciferous vegetables, so like broccoli has it, but you can take it as a supplement. And what it does is it reduces the conversion. Oh, that's the one that's the, uh, uh, there's a lot of that's in cauliflower, right? Yeah. I think yeah, I've heard that yeah. before. It, it reduces, it inhibits uh, the aromatase enzyme and uh, has your, your body will, will convert to less potent forms of estrogen in the body. And so if you're a guy and you find like you have hormone issues, you can supplement with this and you'll know it's working if your libido starts to rise up. And you'll start to feel less of that tenderness in the chest. That's about as good as it gets with natural supplements. Get some cauliflower pizza, dude. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> put the bonbons down and do this some bench solid, press. Solid plug for our girls over yeah, there, man. That's right. Yeah, because <laughs> no, no, cruciferous vegetables have the indole three carbonyl. Right. No, that's um, what, that's what came to mind. They've got said health that. benefits. It's anti-cancer as well. And women, it's got some some pretty good hormone balancing uh, benefits as well. But naturally speaking, that's about as good as you're going to get when it comes to you know balancing your your estrogen levels if you're a man. If it's really bad, you have to go to the doctor, um, mm-hmm. and they'll put you on. I always recommend because I think it's good for all of us to check that occasionally, anyways. And us guys are the worst at that, anyways. We always try to. Most guys avoid the doctors at all costs, and if you're already mm-hmm. having issues in con- this condition, I think it's worth going in there and at least checking that out. Also, remember too that. All of us are genetically different and unique, and we all store and hold body fat in different areas. And unfortunately for you, you know, and, and I'm sure it feels unfortunate because this is it's your body and you're looking at it this way, but it's that way for everybody. Some people are it's low back fat, some people it's belly, mm-hmm. some people it's the flabby arms, some people it's the fat face. You know, some of us can walk around at seven percent body fat and still be fat in the face. Like there's some there's mm-hmm. shitty sides to everywhere you store it. <laughs> Yours is probably in your chest, so therefore it's normally the last place to go. Which all of us can relate to that, regardless if it's yeah. man boobs. It's there's always but, an area that's the last. But place it to go. is weird man like you know and i don't think there's any studies done on this but you know hor- i mean there's some studies right your hormone profile can change how you store body fat too which is kind of weird um i know you were experiencing it right when you went yep. off test like One. you weren't storing body fat the same Dude, way i still to the, i'm still tripping out because i'm not away from it yet i'm getting better and better every week but you know i literally i never looked at my body it's never looked like that 30 fucking six years of my life of, of ups and downs of weight up and down and fat and skinny and buff and all those never seen my body look like this before and it and it just it took it just changed where you it start. took i mean if i'm being very transparent and real it's it took on a very feminine look to it I started to get these kind of hips, you know, like <laughs> it just, dude, I was not feeling it at all, bro. Not I was always drawn to the back of you. I was like, hey, oh, dude, <laughs> I'm not trying to hug you. Get the fuck out of here with that, dude. Yeah. It's not, I did not like it at all. And I'm still battling with it as I, as I'm leaning out right now. And right. So what is now, now yeah. you're, you're obviously now Adams was, you know, cause he was on testosterone, went off testosterone, but if you're natural, can your how your like what makes up your diet change how you store body fat? Theoretically, I'd have to say yes. If you're eating in a way that you're getting lots of cortisol and insulin, you may store body fat a little bit differently than versus if growth hormone is higher and testosterone is higher. So overall health, I think change obviously is going to help with fat loss, but it might help with how you store the body fat as well. And in my experience, this is purely anecdote. Okay, this is my anecdote. But men who tend to store body fat in their chest, in my experience, tend to do better with lower carbohydrate diet. Now, when you look this up online, you see lots of anecdote that kind of, kind of supports this. I don't know if any support, any science will ever support it, but it, it seems to me, whenever I've worked with guys who, because it's not super common, right? It's not super common that a guy will store fat in his chest. It's not super uncommon no. either, but it's not nearly as common as just the belly. Right. And with those guys, it's always like I cut their carbs way down, bumped up their fats, and maybe it's giving them a better hormone profile, but they just got better results than if they did the low-fat type option. So that's my own personal experience. I don't have any science to support it. 
again, you know, the best diet that works for you is the one that's going to work for your particular body, but you got to get leaner mm. and then build up your chest muscles. The bigger your upper chest gets, the less boobish yeah. it's going to yeah. look. Right. Avo- avoid uh, jumping jacks. Not a good thanks, look. Thanks, Justin. Yeah. Appreciate that. Them, t- hey, t- them tedious. Hey, check it out. We already mentioned this, but if you go to uh, your app store, you can get the Mind Pump Media app and listen to our show through it. Also, uh, we have show notes on our website so you can see timestamped what we talk about in every episode. Go to mindpumpmedia.com and go to the podcast tab. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.